in search of soil. Today, I'm talking to Peter McCoy, author of the book, Radical Mycology, teacher at Myco Logos. And Peter, it's been a few years since we talked, and I was trying to think of, you know, what has changed in the world since then? There's a lot of craziness happening out there in the world. There's a lot of climate change talkers out there. And one of the things I thought maybe to start this out with was, are there more mycelium on the planet now than when we talked last, which is, which is probably three or four years ago? Like, is mycelium getting more robust as time goes on, or are we seeing less of it due to the activities of man? Uh, I mean, that's a great question. It'd be pretty hard to to measure. Um, you know, I always like to believe in the resiliency of fungi. I mean, if there's if there's central tenets to mycology is that fungi bounce back and they are great teachers of the ability to bounce back and what resilience really means um, in the natural world. And so, you know, even despite the harshest conditions that uh, the natural world brings about, including extinction level events, fungi seem to always sort of be the pioneers to come back from the greatest detriments um, to environments and spaces. So even what humans are doing, um, even though some of it might be fairly novel in the history of the earth, I would like to think that if not the fungi that were in a place before it was disturbed are the ones that come back, you know, a, a, another group of fungi come in to fill their the niche that the many niches that niches that fungi fulfill, um, because without them, you know, life can't really kickstart. You have those extreme spaces, uh, the really bad um, super fun sites and brownfields and things where it seems like nothing's really alive, although there is always some sort of weed plant growing and, you know, there might very well be fungi there. And perhaps that's where we can come in to actually, of course, facilitate the, the acceleration of what would naturally occur if given time. And so all that's to say that while I can't necessarily quantify it, I don't think fungi are going away anytime soon. You know, even even the worst things that humans might ever do to the planet or the, the temperatures go off the charts more so than we've ever measured or recorded um, in human history, um, I think fungi will still find a way. And that's that's what we find in all the fossil records and all the great extinction level events. Fungi, spore, there's a thicker spore layer in the fossil bed implying that they, were, they sort of dominated the planet churn the nutrients around and enable the next big generation to move forward. And that's one of the things that's always given me, I think, a really solid um, and, and true sense of hope in, in maybe some longer term uh, geological time scale when things might look a little bit more bleak on the immediate human time scale. Just kind of knowing that no matter what fungi will persist, you know, life goes on and the, the nutrient cycle. And, you know, again, things have a way of bouncing back and, and adapting and Another major tenet of fungi is not just resilience, but evolution slash adaptation to to new challenges. So uh, we do find effects of of the things that humans do to the environment, which we can, of course, certainly get into. And changes of soil temperature due to climatic uh, changes are affecting not only plant populations, but fungal populations. And this is being slowly tracked in a handful of studies. So certainly there's concern there for their their patterns their fr the fruiting patterns of mushrooms is a more measurable uh effect we can see you know the season goes longer the mushrooms fruit later this is going to affect nutrient cycling insect populations herbivores who eat and small mammals who eat the mushrooms their populations and everything that comes after that so there's big questions there and certainly things we we're going to be wondering about and maybe to some degree worrying about um but we always i mean for me at least you got to kind of hope that things iron themselves out to some degree with pioneer, uh, with fungi often pioneering or helping show the way. And I think as humans, you know, I mean, we, we have that kind of God complex that we are the tail that wags the dog and we're small in the big scheme of things. And I think it was in your book, your radical mycology that I was reading that something like we produce 7% of the CO2 that's in the atmosphere is human related and something like 85% of it's coming out of the soil. It might not have been in your book. I think it was... But I thought that was a pretty remarkable fact that really a lot of that CO2 is coming out of the soil and people don't think that normally. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm not one to be discussing or really, um, just, you know, arguing about uh, greenhouse gases. You know, they say that CO2 is actually not as bad as some of the other ones, methane and things. But as far as the CO2 goes, uh, the, the lion's share, yeah, by far, I thought it was more than 85%. Um, I have it more in like um, uh, t by by the tons, by billions of tons is the metric I give. But still, it's the the vast vast majority is coming 
uh, out of the soil, but just sort of generally through de fungal decomposition. Fungal respiration is the thought. Fungi respire um, and release CO2 as a part of their cellular metabolism, just like we do. But their their tissue and their volume is in such higher amounts um, throughout the world that they are they are producing so much more than um, even all of our industries and everything combined. So it's it's an interesting you know I, again I can't draw any, draw any conclusions I don't I'm not a climate scientist but it's interesting to think well you know how much have we added in just the last couple hundred years of industrial civilization and what have you to just tip that scale I mean again I don't know the numbers but it is. It, it kind of just puts things in a different perspective, um, you know, and, and you realize, you know, CO2 is super critical for all of life and it's almost this different way to not fear it. I mean, obviously we should be concerned about what we're doing in all the ways and where does that CO2 come from and the other effects of the industries and the automobiles that produce the CO2, they're also producing all kinds of other stuff. Um, but just as far as CO2 is like, we sort of simplify it as like, that's the problem. It's kind of an easy, easy way to bottle it all up. Uh, but it's a critical, you know, gas, a critical molecule in life and plant life. Um, and it's produced by, you know, one of our best allies, the fungi. So if you think about that, I mean, fungi producing CO2, plants consuming CO2, you have the cycle there. It's really us living in their world. Yeah. I mean, one of the ways I, I, I truly think about um, fungi and sort of ecology broadly and humans place in the world is that we, the human system, the humans and, and mammals and higher, higher animal, pretty much all animals are really sub a subsystem of the fungal system that has been here for much longer, for billions of years longer, and is really in so many ways sculpting the world around us. I think a lot of people, uh, for good reason, historically have focused, of course, on the, the flora and fauna, the more visible organisms, and then in more recent decades, the bacteria and those those organisms in the soil and their their role. Fungi have always, just throughout their short history of as a science, mycology rather, has been just sort of swept aside, overlooked, because it's we don't really know much and we didn't know to look there. Um, but the, the whole paradigm shift that comes with studying fungi is that as you learn more, they kind of just seem to take center stage in, in any conversation. You can sound biased, but the science just kind of keeps leading back to that conclusion. And, you know, it, in everything they do, especially throughout the soil, the nutrient cycling, you know, yes, bacteria play a part in the insects and, you know, everything plays a part, of course. But the things that fungi do and sort of the way they do it, we can argue that in especially certain uh, ecosystems, they're, they're critical. I mean, they're just, they're at the center of these webs and without them, if we removed the fungi, everything falls apart. They are the keystone, the grand connectors. And, um, and because of that, you know, everything ripples out essentially sort of, especially from the soil where they're doing a lot of the, some of the most important work, then and we're, you know, as humans, as dependent on the natural world, especially more, hist more so historically, and still today, of course, through all the things we engineer, um, we wouldn't have all the resources we take advantage of without fungi kickstarting, you know, so much of these processes. And it's just a, it's a different twist. It's a way to, uh, there's a lot of reasons I like to, to play that, um, put that picture on the world. When I walk out almost anywhere, even on the sidewalk, I can see fungi in the cracks and sort of think about what they're doing there. But it still just sort of helps you take a step back, reassess your assumptions, um, look, try to look at things differently and, and then just especially from the sort of mycocentric or myco-informed and inspired pers perspective, um, just kind of always wondering, okay, well, what could they be doing? And all these things we don't know. As you learn more, it's one of those things you, you realize what you don't know and what we all don't know. Scientists, the scientific community doesn't know, not just mycologists, but sort of all, all scientists based on their lack of knowledge about mycology as a rule of thumb throughout all of academia. And it kind of, again, kind of brings up this hope for me. And I think a lot of people where you realize, okay, even though we're told all the time, you know, science has sort of figured everything out and, you know, this is how it's looking for the future, you can come back and say, well, we still actually don't know all this stuff about fungi. And as we discover more, there are actually tons of possible positive, you know, very optimistic solutions that they could offer, some good tools for our toolboxes. And let's not, you know, throw in the towel just yet, because it seems like there's a lot we haven't you know, applied uh, in a human system type setting, or even just gone to sort of assess or understand or try to try to measure out in the natural world. Um, and, you know, again, the more we uncover the papers keep coming out all the time, it's such a young science, it just keeps reinforcing this, this perspective, these new sort of paradigms for me and other people, that again, fungi are sort of the, the rulers of the world, the secret, the secret society of the world, um, in some respect, yeah. I mean, thinking about your book as an analogy here, it's 600 and something pages long. If this represented all the knowledge that we have of fungi now, how many pages into the book are we right now? 
Well, that's the thing is we don't know what we don't know. I mean, it really comes out of that. We're at, we're at the beginning really of, of mycology of, um, I like to think I'm, one of my big interests, I have two, there are see two major pillars in the world of mycology. We have the fungal ecology and the big questions there. And then the, the human intersections, the ethnomycology, and that both implies historical relationships, relationships throughout history and cultures around the world, which is interesting uh, to me, but also uh, today, applying our understandings from fungal ecology to human systems and, oops, and uh, to different industries. And, you know, taking, there's, there's a lot of applications, that kind of just to, to put it short. And it's, again, one of these things where we're not only discovering so much about the fungal ecology, we're also looking further into the past or revisiting the past, revisiting our assumptions about human culture, seeing fungi being incorporated in ways anthropologists never thought to think about or to question. Um, and then again, today, you know, more and more young people, entrepreneurs and, and creatives and scientists seeing new applications of, of fungi in, in the things that we do as humans. Uh, in a totally new uh, perspectives as as unprecedented applications. Um, we live in what I like to call the, the the fourth major era or or chapter or volume or what have you in the human fungal story. Um, you know the the first chapter being sort of all of antiquity, all of traditional cultures working with fungi a bunch of different ways and means, and that's the biggest chapter. Then we had the the start of modern mycology as a science roughly 200, 250 years ago. And that was mostly focused on trying to largely name mushrooms and, and lichens to some degree because they were more visible. And then later molds and yeast when we had microscopes. And then in the mid 20th century, culturally we shifted with the psychoactive fungi and better cultivation skills that paralleled and came alongside that and, and went eventually into gourmet mushrooms and medicinals and things as well. And now we have sort of more readily available edible mushrooms. Um, and now in just recent years, it's sort of this uh, transition period over the last 10, 15, however you want to measure it, where we've gone from um, a lot of unknowns um, ecologically, especially in the cultivation world. It was all trial and error for the last 100 years, people trying to figure out how to just grow mushrooms because uh, relative to the 10,000 years of plant domestication, mushroom growing is really on a technical side and, a, and more efficient side, only about 100, 200 years old. So we hardly knew anything. And now we finally come to this point after you know all of human history where we know so much more about their roles throughout the world than ever before. And we have the technology in, in many different realms to apply that knowledge and, and be creative with it. And this leads to all this untapped potential that we're, you know, so many people recognizing. And so, you know, that that's one of the things, I mean, it's the, you know, there's many things I, I love about mycology, but that's a big part of it too. It's just, we don't know what we're going to find or who's going to come up with what tomorrow. And, you know, it keeps you a little bit on the edge of your seat. It's it. Mycology is one of the youngest natural sciences, just from the natural sciences perspective. Naming the mushrooms, naming the microfungi, the molds, and the yeast, and the soil fungi, and figuring out their ecology—that's super young. And all the applications. I mean, it's just it's an exploding field. And there's been many papers, a, a good number, all very well written, very ar articulate, and with all kinds of strong arguments for the last ten years, saying, you know, mycology um, is essentially the the phrase that's been used as a neglected mega science. It's a massive field with so much potential for all these reasons I've discussed and completely overlooked, completely off of everybody's radar, uh, completely missing from all levels of education. And, you know, the, there has been concern in the not, not too distant past uh, among academic mycologists that the science might actually fade from, from really existence. There's very few mycology departments in universities and the funding was going away. I really think that thanks to the internet and, and all the reasons that mycology is sort of popping back up or, or really coming up for the first time in modern history, that won't be an issue going forward, but there was almost a window there where there was a, there was a concern. Yeah, I think in a lot of ways it's it's became it's cool again. It, and yeah, I, it, there's that saying, you know, like all the ideas have been thought of. There aren't any new ideas, and I think the thing that I find most interesting about mycology, fungi, when it comes to the soil and around agriculture, is maybe there is stuff new. Like you could make a new discovery. You could tap into something that could really be a game changer. And a lot of these hacks, tips, tricks, it's just recycled stuff that kind of works or it's been talked about for a very long time. And here we have this wide potential body of knowledge that we don't fully understand. Like you said, we might not know what we don't know yet. And that I think is really exciting. And when you think about just isolating the fungal world and agriculture where do you think ag is with relation to its understanding of 
how important is fungi? Are we in parallel with the rest of the world and the rest of the applications for mycology? Or are we a little ahead? Are we lagging? Yeah, you meaning in North America or Yeah, let's say North America, that? like the Western Western knowledge in agriculture. Do we do we give fungi their due or are we still like that ain't important? Pour some chemicals. Well, on. yeah, no, no. I mean, again, the the rule of thumb it, and it's kind of not to disparage anybody or any group. It's just I go into any um, educational system, any new setting of talking to a bunch of people, assuming that most people don't know anything. And that's just because, you know, not that, you know, I know more or something. It's that literally we don't ever learn. Most people don't learn. They're not in our education systems. They're not in the, in the mainstream media. So I come into it, you know, sort of trying to help people start from the beginning. What are fungi, the basic definition and trying to just build that language, break down the taboos and the barriers and, you know, they're not all bad and they're really interesting and they're not all psychoactive and they're, they have all these benefits and all these things and, you know, sort of, uh, normalize. And that's what a lot of my work has been for, for, you know, over a decade, um, in many different forms, just trying to make this thing not only cool, but, you know, relevant and just as familiar as the notion of bacteria or the notion of backyard gardening of vegetables. You know, it's not necessarily for everybody, but we know about it. It's, it's socially acceptable. It's commonplace and, and it's taught in school just in some form. And we are, we're getting there, you know, more teachers are coming on board and want to teach their kids and stuff. But of course, by and large people that are, uh, you know, in the world doing things, they don't, they don't know much. And so it's, it's definitely my interest to, to help shift that, raise awareness and enable skills so that someday I learn from other people and, and more people are making innovations. You know, right now, the world of applied mycology, which is sort of the you know, outside of academia, uh, just doing stuff with, with fungi in all these different ways. It's very small in the world and, and in North America. There's just a handful of folks, you know, really kind of doing stuff and they're, they're great and innovative, but we need so many more, you know, there's only so much one person can do. And so, you know, I try to do sort of my things, but I've always just been so much more interested in the education and watching the culture grow. And, you know, I can't wait for that because more people are going to come up with more ideas than I ever could. Right. And it's going to be better for everybody. Um, and so that applies in, in, kind of almost any realm you can think of. Um, and depends on what you're, what you want to focus on when we talk about mycology in the realm of sort of food production, if we want to just sort of whittle it down to that, you know, mushroom cultivation, uh, edible mushroom, gourmet mushrooms is fairly uncommon. You know, globally, the market is dominated roughly a third by the portobello slash cremini slash white button mushroom. It's all the same species. Um, it's fairly agriculturally intensive to grow or, or well, the, the system's designed because it's such a large industry. It's very industrially produced, I guess I should say. So it's a bit more removed, less humble than a lot of other mushroom farms, if, if that matters um, to you. But still, it's also the, one of the least nutritious mushrooms, in my, my opinion, one of the least um, delicious mushrooms relative to other species, not to say that you can't cook it well. Um, so that, you know, that's, that right there is just a big turnoff. Most people think that mushrooms don't taste good. This is my experience, um, because they've either had really like just cold mushrooms from the salad bar, you know, not cooked, which is horrible, um, or really poorly cooked. Most restaurants, in my opinion, don't cook them properly. So, so just right there off the culinary standpoint, most people are just, oh, they dismiss it. And then I give them a properly cooked mushroom that tastes better and it blows their mind. They love mushrooms after that. Um, in the realm of agriculture, I guess more specifically, not only are the mushrooms not really cultivated heavily, the, the macro fungi, um, just the, the application of or the ability to utilize essentially almost every, probably all organic waste streams that every agricultural and animal-based system um, produces, the things that we really can't compost easily or can't use as fodder. I believe in time we will find a good way to run that through fungi of some form not only maybe make the, say, a really good example is cotton bean, uh, coffee bean holes, which are too tannic for fodder, after fungal fermentation and digestion, it becomes protein-infused and, and viable fodder. Plus, you get mushrooms out of that. And you apply that to any waste stream um, that we produce, and they've shown through the last century that uh, hundreds of agricultural residues can be used as, as mushroom substrate. If you if you spread that all across the, the Midwest and every every farmer of every scale and backyard gardener and, and enable them through having your neighborhood mushroom growing supply store, like you have your neighborhood plant growing supply stores to take their garden waste or their farm waste and grow another crop out of it or produce fodder or produce a mycelium based tabletop or other object. Uh, and we close our loops so much more, you know, once that becomes co as commonplace again as backyard gardening, I mean, it's, I can't even necessarily imagine or measure the 
the cultural implications and the the resource management implications of that, let alone hopefully how it might you know inspire kids or make them see this process, which cultivation is really strange and unusual the first few times you see it. And I think uh, kids love it and you know whatever that could lead them to to care about nature more and things. Um, and that's just one example. Um, I mean, I could certainly go on, but right there we have a huge loss. Yeah. It's really interesting. I mean, just to think that there's it, something so integral to the cycle of life, something that there's so much of it around us and we understand so little that most people, like, I bet if you ask most people on the street, what is mycelium, they would have zero concept. And maybe even a lot of people listening to this who are educated on the subject they follow. And I mean, they're still like, well, I kind of know what it is. It's that white stuff in the ground. And, and one quote that I saw, and it's in your book, I saw it on your Instagram, blew my mind was, Though not often considered in soil assessments, fungal mycelium and the compounds they produce may be the primary source of carbon for whole soil communities. This has major implications for carbon storage strategies and for understanding system dynamics across biomes. That blew my mind when I read that because that's something I had never thought of. A lot of people in the regenerative ag movement, it's about carbon farming, it's about carbon sequestration, one, to potentially help with climate change, but two, to also feed soils. Like carbon-rich soils are healthier and better for the plants that we want to grow than carbon-deficient soils. Now, where's all that carbon or where is a big source of that carbon in the soils? It's mycelium. And that, again, it blew my mind. And I think a lot of people listening to this in the farm space never would have thought of that before or had heard that before. Yeah, I mean, the there's many types of fungi in the soil and just with, just like the other organisms in the soil, very few of them can be cultured in the laboratory and studied under isolation. And even if they can be, what they're doing under the microscope might be relatively quite different than how they're performing in community. Still, we we know that there there are many types of fungi, um, all kinds of decomposers, some simpler molds, um, certainly many types and in, in and many types of um, ectomycorrhizal mushrooms and truffles. And that's where, and, and other mycorrhizal fungi in general, but especially the mushroom and truffles we can see and are a little bit easier to measure in some respect and genetically sequence. Um, and that that metric or that notion, I mean, that was more or less my rewriting of a similar quote out of out of a paper uh, discussing mycorrhizal fungi. So that, again, it wasn't necessarily me making that up. It's sort of, I believe, I hopefully I have a citation there for that notion. Um, because, yeah, when I read it, I had the same response, you know, the way they said it, this is, and, and yet, you know, it's, a, it's a completely ignored in all, in all soil assessments and ecological, you know, metrics of, of, of environmental health and soil health is, you know, the mycelial community and the, the exudates, the metabolites they produce, you know, what's their quantity, um, because it is so much food for the web. The, the, the notion, in short, is that the, the atmospheric carbon is brought into plants through photosynthesis goes through their body and does lots of things to all the fungi that live inside of them. Every plant is a quilt of potentially trillions of fungi that are helping the plant. And um, those are known as endophytic fungi. Once the carbon makes its rounds, it'll go down to the root, feed its roots and the, you know, the immediate rhizosphere people are familiar with. But most critically, it goes on to the mycorrhizosphere. It incorporates and interacts with the mycorrhizal fungi that are locking on to the root system and that that mycorrhizal, that mycelial network goes on and spreads vast uh, distances and covers so much more surface area because its individual threads, or what are known as hyphae, are so much smaller in diameter relative to even the finest meristem uh, root hair that as they go out, their surface area, well, just their amount of tissue becomes carbon rich. And then as it grows, it's releasing all kinds of compounds, that in, many of which incorporate lots of carbon. Those are released in the environment. That's how the fungus digests and lives in its environment. It releases much of its chemistry. That feeds other organisms, is left behind as the fungus um, accumulates byproducts of uh, digestion. So some of these compounds are digestive. Some of them are protective. And But a lot of waste is left behind. A lot of byproducts of the digestion is left behind as well. That includes carbon, and it makes it more accessible to other organisms and kickstarts uh, some of the some of the branches in the food web. But also the tissue itself. As it grows, it branches um, older branches in the, the network that maybe aren't really uh, accessing nutrients well anymore will be sort of snipped off or culled uh, internally by the fungus, and it's left behind to, to die off, and it becomes food for the soil. Um, and so this there's so much tissue of fungal 
mycelium in the soil. You've probably heard the metrics, you know, in every uh, cubic centimeter, there's miles of mycelium. I mean, um, all that tissue eventually is going to die. And it's, it's one of the primarily translocators of atmospheric carbon into the terrestrial earth. And it, yes, the, the trees do that. They're a grand facilitator, but it's truly the mycelium that goes across hectares to spread it so much further than a single root system can. And that that's the connector. I mean, and then along the way, the mycorrhizae are doing many other things that add to their ecological significance. Uh, but yeah, the carbon sinking, the them being one of the major carbon uh, sources and sinks of soil is, is I mean, it's it, the implications are huge. And again, you're not going to read that in many sources. So, so mycelium itself, what is it made out of? It, it gets cold. It's not producing anymore. It's left in the soil. What is now in the soil when other microorganisms can come digest that? What is it made out of? Well, it's, I mean, the, the cells of, of mycelium are pretty similar internally to animal cells and plant cells. So they have eukaryotic cells in basic you know, biology concepts. Uh, prokaryotes are bacteria with really simple cells. Um, and the eukaryotes are more evolved. Plants have, uh, so animal cells are just kind of like water balloons and we have all the, the, um, organelles and the nucleus and things inside that, but the, the, we have soft tissue, right? Plants have a cell wall that includes cellulose, hemicellulose, and potentially lignin if it's a more woody plant. And that gives the plant structure to grow upright without flopping over unless it's, um, a simpler plant. And then, um, and that's one of the distinguishing features of plants is their cell wall structure. Fungi also have a cell wall, so it's an extra layer beyond the the water balloon, the cell membrane that contains the the internal components. But their cell wall is different from plants. So its primary compounds are uh, chitin. It's the same compound that makes up insect exoskeletons and lobster shells. So microscopically, it's a very thin layer, but it's still rigid, firm, gives the fungus structure and a bit of protection from the pressures of water or, or being inside of a log or inside of the soil. Um, and then it, that's about 10% of the cell wall structure. The other 80 to 90% are high weight table sugars and, or excuse me, that high weight sugars and not table sugar. So much more complex than fruit sugars or table sugar, a very long chain, high molecular weight, very complex, uh, sugars and sugars are made up of, uh, they're called polysaccharides and they're made up of monosaccharides, individual units of carbon rich rings tons and tons and tons of carbon. And this is what prim primarily forms the vast majority of the fungal cell wall is, is, you know, I don't have the exact percentage, but it's a ton of carbon. Um, a lot of these sugars are actually what we attribute some of the medicinal effects of fungi to. So it's, it's, that's where a lot of that comes from is these medicinal, these sugars, some of these sugars. And a lot of that, again, just folds away and is easy to be digested by microbes. It's a, it's essentially a sugar. The, the bond between each of the monomers is the same type of bond you'll find in simple fruit sugars. Uh, you just have many of them strung together in one super long chain, whereas simple sugars are just a few of these monomers and they're fairly short. And so that's a lot of what's left behind. Uh, again, 80 to 90% of the whole cell wall, you know, a lot of this fungal structure, what makes it unusual or, or different from other organisms is, is this material. Uh, and I guess, well, I guess just last bit for the people that want all the details on the exterior of it, this is a little bit more, it's pretty interesting. There's also a thin layer of proteins, um, which are fairly um, hydrophobic. And so it actually repels water. And it's actually thought that this helps the mycelium glide through its substrate more easily because it's sort of sliding through it and pushing stuff away, um, which has an effect on the qualities of mycelium as a structural material. It makes it fire retardant. Actually, it makes it more buoyant and things. Um, but Maybe that's, uh, that's more of an aside. No, no, it's great. I, I mean, it's totally cool how this all works. And I mean, the remarkable thing about fungi is all these layers, along with other things happening within the organism itself, make it hard to penetrate while it's living. If it calls off, given how kind of the soil cycle works, is a lot of that stuff going to be bioavailable to the other organisms in the soil when it's no longer there? Or are you going to need other fungi to come digest the old fungi so then other organisms can get access to that? Or when it sloughs off, is it kind of fair game for other things in the soil that might want to have targeted it when it was alive, but now it's not? Yeah, I mean, 
um, a, when the mycelium dies or even probably when it's alive too and can't fend for itself really, it only can really defend through the release of chemicals. It doesn't have, you know, uh, 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 appendages or anything like that or, or fingers or mouths or anything. Um, insects do come along and, and micro insects and things in the soil and, and, and other microbes um, will eat the fungal tissue and just chomp right through it. The tissue passes through the digestive tract of the insect becomes its waste other microbes uh, or microbes then come and eat that waste and here's a big part of the the soil web but generally the fungi you know they can't really fight off insects so much other than maybe trying to create you know noxious compounds and things um, generally the, their their defense mechanism is as i said the release at their growth tips as they're they're growing it's a branching network and at the tips all kinds of chemicals are being released including antibiotics antifungal compounds to fight off other fungi that might want to attack it there are fungi that that do hurt other fungi and can penetrate and kill them while they're alive um, which is an we can actually talk about that as an important soil uh, group of soil fungi um, and then also antivirals so there are viruses that can attack fungi but they're uh, I like to think of fungi as nature's greatest chemists, and I know a lot of plant folks won't necessarily agree with that, but a lot of the chemistry inside of plants we're finding is actually produced not really by the plant, but at least directly or initiated to a pretty good degree by the internal fungi inside of inside of the plant, and that's just a whole new realm of discovery uh, and a different discussion perhaps. But So they're just incredible chemists, I guess, is a short story, and part of their Part of that is exemplified through their ability to defend and adapt and you know grow in all conditions largely through essentially entirely through the production of their unique host of and suite of chemicals for a lot of the, the fungi that pair up with plants do you have any sense of how much of the carbon that makes them up is coming from the plants like are, are they 100 percent dependent upon those plants to survive that's where they're getting the carbon or can they synthesize that themselves from other organic matter in the soil. Well, the you know the rule of thumb when you get introduced to mycorrhizal fungi, we can start there. The the endophytic fungi that live inside of plants, there's just lots of questions around how they operate and a lot of the nutrient exchange. Um, big big questions there. So I can't say so much about those fungi, although I do imagine certainly they're getting you know tons of their carbon. I mean that's that's essentially their host that's feeding them and then they provide a lot of um, effects and compounds to the plant as an exchange. So I'd imagine, I mean, I can't imagine where else they'd be getting their food actually. I mean, they're getting probably all of it from their plant host in, in large part. Um, but as far as the mycorrhizal fungi go, they are much more conclusively studied and much more directly studied. And the rule of thumb you'll hear with mycorrhizal fungi, there's seven categories of them. And the, the, the bottom line they always tell you is that all the carbon, the, the reason it happens and works is the fungus draws in water and minerals and maybe other nutrients, including, say, nitrogen from the environment through its its vast mycelial network with the high surface area that I described, brings that to its plant partner, and in exchange, the plant provides excess photosynthesized sugars, and that's the trade-off. And that does seem to be holding true for most types of fungi. One of the exceptions, I think one of the better exceptions is, or and there's, and there's kind of two, is... Um, the ericoid mycorrhizal fungi, these are the fungi that associate with, I'm pretty sure, all ericaceous plants, all plants in the ericaceae. And these fungi uh, and plants often live in very acidic soils, really, really extreme, you know, northern climates, um, heathlands, and things like this, and bogs. And the fungi, uh, through their chemistry, help to uh, buffer the soil pH so that nutrients don't get locked up, minerals don't become unavailable. And at the same time, when the plants in the surrounding environment, sometimes you'll have a heathland that's just all heath pretty much. And when the plant dies, the same fungus will is the one responsible for digesting you know, the, the plant right next to it or what have you and then feeding it to this other plant. So in that case, they're actually the ones taking in the carbon and moving it and feeding the plant. The exchange is going the other way that, it, that it's not supposed to. Um, in, in that case, this is another example where the, air, the aerocord mycorrhizae have been considered and called the drivers of these whole ecosystems. Because without them, they are the ones completely essentially creating, in large part, the carbon cycle. Sure, there is some carbon coming in through photosynthesis, but uh, so much of it is being cycled through the soil and, and all the chemistry effects uh, via these fungi. Another good example of how it can go backwards or the wrong way is with the monotropoid mycorrhizae. And these are uh, fungi that associate with the plants in the, monotro in the, the monotropa, the non-photosynthesizing, uh, you know, the pink, the, the white plants. 
uh, ghost pipe and things. And so these plants are not photosynthesizing, yet they're surviving. They need carbon, so they must be getting all of their carbon or the vast majority, maybe a little bit from other microbes or something, but the vast majority from their mycorrhizal partner. And this association is is only formed with a small number of fungi, the monotropoid ecto, uh, mycorrhizal fungi, monotropoid mycorrhizae. But what's curious about them, uh, just to put a twist on it all, is those fungi need to be getting their carbon from somewhere. And so they're not able really to get it out of the soil. Rather, they are connected over, you know, here's the ghost pipe, here's the fungus in the middle, and over here's the tree. And the tree comes down, forms what's called an ectomycorrhizal relationship. The structure looks different. All that's going on in the, the root fungal interaction is very different, but it's the same fungus. And then over on this other end, it's the monotropoid association. The structure is different. How it interacts with the root is different. How it looks is different. Same fungus. And it's essentially a conduit and feeding and keeping these plants alive. And you, they, they frame it as, and they call it a parasitism. They say that these plants are being myco, mycotrophic and they're feeding off the fungi. I mean, I, you know, it's a way to frame it. I like to think that there's a reason this happens, that, that the fungi are smart enough or what have you, that they, as they evolve, they wouldn't have let this parasitism to occur. There are other parasites, of course, throughout nature, and maybe that's, that's all that is. But I like to think there's something to it. And some reason they keep these interesting plants alive and there's some other exchange. Um, but generally, for, you know, the ectomycorrhizal mushrooms, the mushroom and truffle formers, um, as well as our arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi, which are some of our most critical soil fungi, uh, they seem to be heavily, if not yeah, entirely dependent on their plant partner for survival, primarily, especially through the carbon acquisition. Yeah, and if we just start talking like the commonly cultivated plants that form relationships with AB fungi, arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi, it, one quote that you have in here is... Roots are essentially porous anchors that primarily stabilize the plants and serve as a beacon and platform for the beneficial microbes and fungi that actually produce and provide much of the plant's nutrition. So let's say we have a plant that needs that AB association with it. We remove that. What is that plant now left to do on its own and what, what can it do on its own? Is it just photosynthesizing and are you are, are the roots not taking in these minerals in the soil because the microorganisms aren't there to hand them essentially off to the roots can you shed any light on what's going on there well um i mean you got to again imagine that a, a root network we've all seen the diagrams they they look different you know, they come in different forms but essentially they're limited to accessing what's immediately on the right in the exterior of the root um you know, they, there's there's diffusion. As when there's a rain, there might be some osmosis or things dissolve, and they, then it washes over the root, and it can okay, oh, I can sponge up a little more. That's what will happen when we pour liquid fertilizers on our plant. Oh, it's getting a little bath of nutrients, and it just sponges that up. Because it, it, you know, I, I'm sure it could be contradicted by a, a somebody who's more, much more educated in plant chemistry. But by and large, plants aren't releasing many compounds that dramatically transform nutrients and, and, and decompose wood matter right into base elements for its survival. Plants have evolved and we can we can talk a lot about fungal evolution and it's a it's a open and shut case for me when if we want to get into there. But uh, plants have evolved from the beginning to be entirely dependent on fungi inside and out. And some have become better at being what we call weeds, more surviving without so many other partners and more extreme soils and things. But still, they probably have internal fungi for sure um, and would probably not stray away from, you know, the addition of fungi if they were given the choice. And so, but you take away the, the, the microbes and microbes do a lot, bacteria and stuff, of course, do a lot of too. But the, the unique thing about fungi is they're filamentous. And you do have filamentous fungi, uh, microbes, actinomyces and things that form networks. But the way that fungi do it, their structure, their diversity, their, their chemistry arguably is much richer or their chemical skill set um, and their ability to you know travel so far, connect to other plants, move nutrients from one plant that's really healthy to a plant that's deficient. And that's certainly been shown in lots of studies talking about that. You don't really find that so much with the bacteria. It's not as a uh, dynamic or complex a relationship. And so, so the plants are, again, they, from the get go, from day one, they've been just helped by helped heavily by their, their, um, microscopic partners. So why would they have evolved to, to need to do anything else? They do their, their skills. Well, and the other organisms do the other skills. Now we've come along as humans, especially in more recent centuries 
totally upended that, shifted the soil dynamic, destroyed the soils, removed all these organisms. The plant, you know, has no shield, essentially, no no friend to protect it and feed it on its roots. So they get root rot. Other fungi just essentially come in to shake things up and say, this is an unhealthy system and I need to cause succession, which is what they do throughout nature as another major role of fungi. And we try to fight that off and say that they're bad. We don't look at the underlying problem. And then we try to bandage it with all kinds of, you know, of course, chemicals and, and uh, pesticides and also try to just feed the starving plant and waste a lot of it as a lot of it gets washed into the groundwater and, or locked up in the soil. And we, we waste tons of nutrients and phosphorus um, when from the get go, if we only had, you know, the good natural soil that that the plants evolved to be in something much more, uh, you know, rich, all, all the things we want from soil. Um, and then as a part of that, a healthy uh so, soil community of all the members of the soil web with fungi being pretty critical in, in their own unique ways. Um, so yeah, we, you know, we, people often refer to the rhizosphere and, but by and large, you know, unless you're in a, in a, in a totally sterile soil or in a really heavily, you know, destroyed soil where there is no life by and large, we actually should be talking and always thinking about the mycorrhizosphere and, and most plants are mycorrhizal, especially in a natural setting and, all these dynamics that I'm mentioning are occurring in an incredibly dynamic uh, four-dimensional uh, relationship. So the, their succession, meaning over time, these change. Every root hair could be constantly changing in just a few days. Another fungus is there, and it's a lot going on. Um, so, yeah, when you lose – so, yes, you can come into your field or your garden and inoculate with five species from a commercial product. But you're not nearly going to have the diversity you would have in a in a you know, more normal soil, healthy soil, natural soil that has – dozens, hundreds of species doing many processes that aren't necessarily directly mycorrhizal, but maybe producing other compounds that stimulate the plants or other microbes and all these interlocking webs. And, you know, without knowing very much about all this, we know so, so little really um, about these more complex dynamics. We're kind of playing the Russian roulette, right, where we take stuff away and think like, oh, let's just strip it down to its simplest form. And then at some point along the way, just everything stops working. Thinking about this, there, there are, most plants form these relationships. Some don't. And when it, in the vegetable world, it's brassicas, it's it's beets, spinach. They don't. What, what's theoretically the reason why they might not form their relationship when the others do? Well, the the they they they, they sort of trick you there. Um, I thought that for a long time too, and then you look into it, and actually, and I could be corrected wrong. I haven't seen anything. I haven't found the paper that's conclusive saying. You know, this one plant doesn't do this, but a lot of brassicaceae plants, and I, I would I would not be surprised if all plants, but including the brassicas, brassicas, form actually a different type of root fungal association. What defines a mycorrhiza, so they say it's not mycorrhizal and it's not a true mycorrhiza. What defines a mycorrhiza is that there's sort of three major components. There's an initiation stage, a sort of uh, recognition stage that can be measured. Um, there's actually chemical uh, signaling that can be measured between these different fungi and the plant root might change its structure to accommodate the uh, entering fungus. So that can be detected. There's a, there's a, there's a process. Once the fungus is inside the root system, there'll be, a, and this is the key component, there's sort of a dedicated and defined structure, and which is supposed in most cases to be the site of nutrient exchange. And then the fungus penetrates the plant root system to some degree and also has external or hyper, um, hyper radical mycelium, essentially what goes out of the root into the soil. So those three things together is what defines uh, a true mycorrhiza. And then we distinguish the seven major varieties of mycorrhizae based on those three things, the process formed, the internal structures, maybe how the external mycelium looks, um, and as well as which fungi might be involved, but usually more importantly, which plant host is involved, like the monotropa or the ericaceae is good examples. Now in brassicas, the, we don't find any true mycorrhiza, but what we do often find in a, when possible or healthy enough soil for the plant is what are known as dark septate endophyte uh, hyph, uh, mice fungi, excuse me, or DSEs, dark septate endophytes. So endophytes are the fungi that live inside of plants. There are four major categories of them. One of them is the DSEs, or these, the, and they're only root associating, the, root associating. The other three varieties are more commonly found in aerial parts of the plant, 
and some of them are found in the roots to a degree, but the DSEs are primarily in the roots and they, they can be in the root. They can go out to the environment and are probably performing very similar functions to a mycorrhiza. They just don't really have a strong initiation uh, moment. The root might not really compromise or, or, or rather alter itself for that fungal exchange or this, their interaction. And there's no defined structure, which is the big thing that they say, well, it's not a true mycorrhiza, but it's probably performing a very similar function. Um, so that's when I sort of learned about that. It was kind of like a big ha ha, uh, like a ha ha laughing and also aha moment. Um, so, you know, again, the, unfortunately, the, the words have sort of been used against us or not used against us, but sort of misleading uh, through the definition. And, but again, it sort of proves the point that in my mind that fungi um, have been there. And that was what I was referring to earlier that even the plants we might think of as weeds that don't need them, they, they still have all kinds of endophytes above ground for sure and might very well also have these other root endophytes that just aren't commonly talked about. The, unfortunately, DSEs, dark septate endophytes, just are really poorly studied. So their actual ecological significance, their, their importance for brassicas and things, uh, sadly, as with so many other looming, large, obvious questions in mycology, just hasn't really been thoroughly investigated. We can talk about them. I can say maybe a few points, um, but not really much. You know, there's a lot of great questions. Even the viewer just hearing this for the first time might be wondering about this. What about this? What about this? And just the research might not have been done yet, unfortunately. And that's the state of mycology, uh, which again is hopefully going to be changing in you know, the coming years. Yeah, I think that's the thing with a lot of knowledge. When we don't know the answer for sure, we say, well, it doesn't do it. Because we can't prove that it did. We can't know of a study to point to that shows that it did. We just, it might, we just don't know how to interpret it. We can't see it. We haven't studied it. So I think that's really interesting. I mean, thinking about this and, and given your knowledge and familiarity around this subject, does this make sense? If you were growing brassicas and you wanted to encourage the fungi to come in that would benefit them, you'd want to grow them in the same place as much as you can, like as year round if possible, or depending upon climate, like just keep them there more or less in permanence because you want to propagate those fungi and they always need a host and that those relationships need to be intact. Similar with the more common AB fungi that are in having relationships with plants, let's say lettuce or something like that, you always grow that in the same spot because it needs a live host it can, it can sporulate and lay dormant for the next crop. But if you're, if you're rotating these crops through brassica to something else and, and you're breaking up the relationships, if we're just looking at the mycosphere or the rhizosphere, no, mycosphere, then are we, are we doing damage by that crop rotation or should we have crops in the same place, which contradicts a lot of traditional ag thinking of crop rotation where we're, we're breaking up a lot of these relationships that are forming below the soil? I mean, the logic, yeah, I mean, it, I mean it, in my mind, draws to what you're, you're pointing to, a no-till practice and a, a, a reduced or, or different type of rotation practice perhaps maybe you swap out rather than a completely different type of plant in a bed it's just a different brassica the following year you know um not being as rich of a plant grower not having nearly as much knowledge about it as, as yourself or probably many of your viewers i can only say so much about good plant growing practices um, but i have to imagine that a lot of a lot of that knowledge a lot of that insight from traditional growers um, developed in this, the notion of rotation and all these these things and tilling um, came in by witnessing plant uh, root pathogens and, and and root rot and all these things coming in. And again, the, obviously the notion is you want to move it so that you don't establish a problematic uh, organism in the soil. And I, I definitely have to wonder if those things pop up just like they do in really any system in, inside of any unhealthy organism in the environment, a, a predatory fungus or other infectious agent will show up usually because the host is compromised. And, and in this case, not only the plant might be weakened, maybe it doesn't have all the endophytic fungi that it needs um, and has also evolved to get. Endophytes are transmitted in the natural world. Uh, some live inside of seeds and they're passed through lineages of plants. It's called vertical transmission and they, they, carry inside of the seed, which I think is pretty incredible. But many of them are also horizontally transmitted, meaning that in the, the spores will drift from basically growing out of a leaf, if you will, or when an insect bites a leaf, it gets some of that endophyte, moves to the next plant, and deposits it, and then the, the beetle waste or the, uh, excuse me, the insect waste will land on the plant, 
there's some viable fungal tissue or spores there and literally just grows between the the the, the leaf cells and starts to enter the plant. That's how these are vertically or tra horizontally transmitted. So in a healthy forest setting where you have such plant diversity, every plant and even the plants in the same stand, the same species right next to each other, they might have a slightly different uh, endophytic community. This might very well be why a healthy, otherwise healthy tree has a really unhealthy branch. Everything else is fine and the, the, the problem isn't spreading. It's just maybe that branch didn't get a good assembly of endophytes or it's missing one of them. I don't know. And so, you know, in our monocultures or in our really uh, stripped down agricultural settings where we don't have all the rich diversity of all the plants and insects and stuff moving all these endophytic fungi around, I wonder if that's a big problem. And it's the, you know, that's that's just one of my uh, hypotheses, really hard to measure, uh, but it could be tested for, I think, in a, in a larger scale. And then similarly below ground. You know, of course, yeah, we lose the mycorrhizal fungi, all the benefits they provide there. We we, we we disrupt all the community that the mycorrhizae also need. I mean, they no hypha is an island. You know, they they need a uh, community to be in and exchange things with, not just the one plant, one fungus relationship. So certainly the, the tillage and the disruption um, could be playing into that. And that's, yeah, one of the big arguments with the, especially mycorrhizal fungi, you're trying to establish them. I mean, some of the AM fungi, uh, some of the arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi, they can persist. I mean, their their spores germinate, and within you know just a week or two, they start to associate with the plant or less. And you know, within a very short period of time, can be providing benefits to their plant partner. And at the end of the season, if you till, you might lose that that network. But if you re-inoculate, uh, they'll might very well come back. And some of them also could sporulate if if given an, if you don't till too early, and they get a chance to get to their sporulation stage. And some of those arbuscular mycorrhizae can survive tillage, though generally they don't really survive going to different soil depths than they're they're meant to be in, um, their spores that is. So, you know, it's, it is a bit of a debate. And of course, I wouldn't want to tell somebody that's till dependent to swap switch tomorrow, but it's a big, big conversation. And I think it kind of, again, comes back to what are we, what is the actual problem? Is it the, 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 the root rots establishing and we got to sort of run away from them? Or is it actually, is that just a symptom of a greater ill where the, the ecosystem or the, the sort of ecology of the garden isn't right? Um, uh, the the endophytic community of the individual plant isn't quite right, and yeah, these are these are looming questions. Um, certainly, one in one one of the applications, one of the sort of leading edge realms of of applied mycology, more industrial mycology, really is creating endophyte inoculum. So there are endophytes that are known to dramatically provide drought salinity, heat tolerance to their host plant. Individual species have been identified from extreme environments and then isolated, applied to a commercial crop plant in a greenhouse and transmit similar drought tolerance. And so there's, of course, a lot of interest to applying that globally, commercially, um, as the world heats up, things dry out. Big questions there, big concerns come along with that for me of, of again, us, like you say, being the tail that wags the dog or playing God. Because if we push in one fungi, are we pushing something else out? Uh, we don't really know what we're doing inside of the fungus when we start to do all this. It's a really compelling topic. Obviously, there's it should be looked at. Um, but I just have lots of, you know, sort of concerns or reservations around it that are beyond my control. Um Someday there's going to be these commercial products and people are going to be using them and they'll work, but who knows what the long-term effect will be, just like with all of our pesticides and things that we just, you know, don't question. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I guess I could go on, but maybe leave it there. Well, it, tell me if I'm overreaching here. So I, I used to watch the old school Batman as a kid and Batman would always get in trouble midway through the episode, yet he would always win out at the end of the day. And, and I'm thinking that fungi being the chemists that they are, they are Batman. They are ever resilient. They're trying to be attacked. They're trying to be shut down, but they find a way. If I just look outside, if you look at history, nature has evolved. There's always this cycle of decay and growth, but plants wouldn't be around. The planet wouldn't have evolved if, if the bad stuff just had taken over. Is it safe to assume, or, or could you, could you draw, potentially draw this conclusion that if you had a robust soil and above ground ecosystem, that the power of the fungi would remove a lot of these bad root pathogens from the equation. So you wouldn't get the root rot. You wouldn't get fusarium. That if, if those relationships were intact and running at full speed and everything was good, that 
the good would win and we'd be all good. I mean, exactly. I mean, if, if, if these, if Phytophthora was so, uh, such an epidemic, then, you know, all plants, it would just be a, a wave of plant death, you know, in front of it and nothing could stop it. So what's stopping it when it hits a boundary, it's probably helpful fungi that are well established and protecting their plant partners. Um, I mean, it's, it's a pretty, again, kind of an open shut, another sort of open shut case for me. You just look at the studies and there's, there's decades of research at this point with especially the arbuscular mycorrhizae as a, as a group of mycorrhizae for their ability to, de to defend and protect, uh, commercial, uh, annual crops from Phytophthora, from Fusarium, from a lot of the, some of the most common root pathogens, tons of research, easy to look up, um, you know, just the, the, the problem is it hasn't been accepted by, by big ag for probably any number of reasons and the, the farm, you know, the chemical companies doing their thing. Um, but I think it's also bad application is, is definitely something I suspect one of the problems and challenges with, especially our buscular mycorrhizae is a great example is that if you over you, you add the fungus as an oculum, sure. But if you over fertilize the plant or actually give it what's sort of a, a normal dose for an average farmer it doesn't need the fungus to do the fungal uh, nutrient provision. So the fungus germinates, the plant won't take it in, the fungus dies because uh, the, the AM fungi it. need... Yeah, the, the fungus it has about seven to 10 days after spore germination to find and, and be accepted by a plant host. If it doesn't get that, it'll just die in the soil. So if you're feeding the, the plant, you know, just pouring it on, it doesn't, doesn't need that fungus, won't waste its resources to feed someone else. And then the fungus can't not only die, but then it can't provide that shield and protection and all the defense compounds against these root pathogens. So that's a that's a big challenge. Um, you can look at the the good research by the Rodale Institute on some of their suggestions for not only using you know commercial uh, sort of industrial fertilizers, but also compost and and sort of approximate ratios to apply. You're essentially under fertilizing, which is going to be uh, concerning for your average grower, but you 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 have to. And their their research is a really good resource for creating commercial or rather home scale or farm scale AM inoculum yourself. Um, there's a lot to say about that. I actually go into it quite a good bit in my book, uh, but there's tons of tons to say on all that. Um, well, in there's, theory, there's like holding you there, I mean, in theory, if these relationships are intact, you're not fertilizing at all because the field across the street that's growing wild is thriving. It's trying to take over your cultivation. It's not being fertilized. These relationships are fertilizing themselves. Yeah, I mean, it, it becomes a question of, you know, how much do you need to to, to feed the soil and amend the soil to, to better, you know, you, pr you provide the food that the fungus can eat to then digest and then feed to the plant. Um, there's there's some good, you know, thoughts around that, not really any any perfect or, or really definitive protocols, although lots of good thinking about adding different, you know, fatty acid sources to the soil to, pr to provision the soil is the phrase that gets used to, for the fungus, you know, as it works, does its work for the plant. Um, lots of good questions there. A, a great notion, a really big one, especially, especially as we start to think about the, the concerns of peak phosphorus and, and f drying up all our phosphorus mines, is rather than take phosphorus rock, all the extraction that goes into that, industrially process it into a water-soluble form using very strong acids to then create a water-soluble form of phosphorus we can apply to plants on a obviously non-organic uh, approach. Rather, you, which is, in that whole approach, is essentially mimicking what our buscular mycorrhizal fungi and phosphorus-solubilizing bacteria are doing, where in the soil, if you have the organisms healthy, some phosphate rock, these organisms, these microbes and fungi release organic acids that slough off, solubilize, release phosphorus out of the rock for themselves and for their plant partner. And you're dosing it out. None is wasted. Nature does its thing. And that's certainly a, a you know, sort of you read this in literature, you know, kind of do this. There's, there's not really good perfect protocols or exact numbers. Um, there's, it's still very much in the realm of we need to experiment more, unfortunately. Um, but that would be, yeah, you, as you're sort of saying, you wouldn't be wasting much. You wouldn't have, you'd help reduce, especially these inputs there. Um, and if there's enough kind of going around enough organic matter and all the other sort of food sources and all the, all the compost we, we would love to give otherwise, you would, you would be hoping that the fungi and other food web organisms would be churning it all up so we wouldn't have to put in so much more. And as the byproduct, the plant is well protected and happy and healthy. The, the alternative to that 
you know, because the ch- there are so much challenges with AM fungi, especially with an imprecise inoculation strategy or, or propagation strategy at this point in history, a lot of research has also gone into working with trichoderma molds. Uh, trichoderma is a, it's a simple green mold and very ubiquitous in soils around the world. And there's a lot of research, especially in an application, especially coming out of India from what I've seen, cultivating these molds, very simple and grow them on wheat bran. They'll eat anything. It's a, it's a green, ugly mold, uh, but it'll rip through your compost and actually is used as a common compost activator is the term fungal compost activator is just trichoderma species it speeds up the breakdown of cellulose. They have really strong cellulases or, or cellulose digesting enzymes. And at the same time, they're a uh, plant protector. So they are seem to be a major check and balance in the soil system against pathogenic fungi. Um, in the mushroom farm, they attack our mushrooms. Mushrooms are kind of one of our bigger problems here because um, they, they'll coil around this as I was referring to them a little bit ago where they actually will, their hyphae or their mycelium will coil around the mycelium of, a, of another fungus and burrow into it. They have chitinases so they can break through the chitin, burrow into the mycelium of the other, other their parasite, the thing they're parasitizing, and then travel internally through the other mycelium of the other fungus. Pretty crazy. But they can do that um, against root pathogens. And so actually, and it's been talked about that just like the dark septate endophytes, they perform a pseudo mycorrhizal association. They can actually penetrate into the root system of plants that don't have other that don't otherwise have, say, an arbuscular mycorrhizal relationship and essentially perform, I think, a similar function, probably nutrient acquisition, definitely plant protection that's been shown. And at the end of all of it, a healthier and larger crop. And again, lots of studies with trichoderma showing this fairly foolproof, probably a better approach in a lot of instances than the AM fungi because of their difficulty. But, you know, too much to my and maybe many of your listeners' surprise, when was the last time you heard about trichoderma? Um, maybe this audience especially, maybe more of them have heard about it, but most people haven't. In, in, I do see it in the stores. You do see, you know, it might not say trichoderma. Uh, I won't have a picture of this kind of not so pretty mold. But uh, if you see a fungal additive and often with uh, mycorrhizal additives, they'll incorporate trichoderma as one of the fungi, which is not a true, again, trying to true mycorrhiza. So you might actually get benefit out of the product, but was it the arbuscular mycorrhiza that was providing the benefit or was it actually the trichoderma because it was able to survive? It's a question I have about these commercial products, um, maybe a little bit deceptive in some way, which is, I mean, it's fine. You're getting soil, fungi in your soil in, you know, all, all better for it. I just wish there was, you know, better practice, more awareness on the on the user end so that you know as awareness and, uh, and, and sort of culture on this grows we can have better more informed discussions um yeah <laughs> i'll leave it there you know a lot of people want to speed this up they want to add something to the soil and put it there assuming it's not there to begin with and in a lot of cases in bad practices it's not there to begin with do you do you have enough faith in nature that if you start growing that these things fungi, the trichoderma, they will show up even if you're not trying to put them there by doing, you know, in these more regenerative practices, you're not using chemicals, you're not using fungicides, you're using crops that are putting a lot of sugars and exudates into the soil. My, my thought is eventually, like that's going to look attractive to fungi. However it gets there, it's going to find a way to get there and say, you know, I want some of this. Yeah, I mean, fungi will always find a way. It's it just, again, we have opposable thumbs and a prefrontal cortex to to speed up what nature would, would do over a much longer period of time. You know, again, learning to grow a mold on, on some old, you know, newspaper or wheat bran, just like I, uh, indigenous microorganisms or something, or even simpler, um, just needs maybe to become the another tool in the toolbox for, for folks already doing all these other great skills you just mentioned. You know, growing the mold is maybe one of the simpler ones. It just becomes another amendment. Um, by and large, you know, as much as I've seen, there's really no, there's, we, we're not really concerned about the trichoderma um, negatively impact, impacting crops. So, you know, unless you have like a really healthy soil fungal uh, mycorrhizal community, you know, maybe you don't need to add the, the trichoderma there. But again, if your soil is fairly depleted, you're tilling all the time, you probably don't have a lot of established fungi, at least doing a little test plot with these trichoderma, there's really no risk there and, and certainly well worth it. And you can buy products that have it, um, but learning to grow it yourself um, is maybe something to look into. Um, there, there's even methods. I mean, a bigger concept with with soil and fungal soil inoculum is, and the research shows this to be true, is that rather than buying commercial products, even though they might have a well 
developed uh, strain or varietal of, of, um, of a given fungus, which shows in their work to be the best one. Um, there's a lot of argumentation around, while that might be the case, harvesting one locally from your local soil system and climate is, and then learning to propagate that out through you know, beginner to intermediate techniques is much more worth it. And they're more fine-tuned to the to soil ecology, uh, the climate, again, elevation, all this stuff. And, um, and in some cases, especially in more endemic and rare plants, uh, there I've seen studies where the commercial products did not work, and when they harvested the local fungi from the you know special uh, biome or what have you, propagated it out in the in the greenhouse and brought it back, then the plant survived. Whereas the commercial soil inoculum, you know, maybe even had a negative effect. I've seen that. So uh, again, more nuances there. So you might get all these false negatives or. Uh, or even a false positive where you think it's the AM fungi, but it's actually trichoderma in the mix or something. But so where we it all adds up to maybe a, a more confusion than I would like. Um, but I think we'll will eventually just be clarified as more people you know learn about it and and sort of delineate all the terms and and sometimes even though people call um, you know the wrong type of fungus the wrong thing and you know just terminology is is a stumbling block. But we'll 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 get over that in not too much time. Well, that's it. I mean, a lot of this seems intimidating and I think a lot of people can get like in the weeds really quick in terms of knowledge. But I think you go out there, you try stuff and, and you learn from it. And along those lines, one way to add beneficial microbes to the soil is through compost. And, and one thing I see a lot, I see a lot of people commenting on this on YouTube is they're always wanting to speed up compost. And from talking to people like Dr. Elaine Ingham, her belief is that a lot of soils are more, a lot of agricultural soils are heavily bacterially dominated. And we need to move that closer to a one-to-one -one fungal to bacterial ratio where a lot of plants like it. So a lot of these quick composts, the theory, this is my theory, kind of piecing together a lot of knowledge is if you're composting stuff real quickly using manures and, and grass clippings and stuff like that, you're getting a lot of bacteria in there. You're not giving fungi the time to go in to really develop, to increase the diversity, to increase the amount, and you're not giving really them the food that they want. So if I create a quick compost and I'm done in 30 days, it might look great. It might be this brown stuff. Is it safe to assume that time is needed to develop the fungi that are going to benefit the soil or using quick compostable ingredients and a lot of turning where you're generating all this heat, do you think you can build up fungi in a pile like that, given your knowledge of fungi and how they proliferate? Well, I mean, you know, the first question is what, what kind of fungi? I mean, there's, there's a, anywhere from 1.5 to 6 million fungal species in the world, um, you know, and, and many of them live in the soil. So that's one of these things I always think about with, uh, well, we just need more fungi in our soil. Well, what, what kind? Um, and, and there's a huge questions there because we can we can isolate some fungi out of the soil, as I said early on. Um, and there's there's easy ways to do that, even the simpler molds and things. You know, trichoderma is one, but there's many other molds you can isolate from the soil and look at and name. Uh, but then you ask, okay, well, what's it doing in the soil? What's its ecological role? Uh, I don't know. It's probably a decomposer. You know, that's that's what I've been told in some more advanced workshops and things I've taken and, and looking into the literature. It's just this is what it is. This is how we name it. It's like, okay, well, what's it doing? And it's it's just because again, like you, I think said earlier, we, we just we don't actually know. It's not anybody's real fault. It's just that uh, even after decades looking at it, it's about as far as we've come. So, and I greatly respect Dr. Ling Ingham's work. Um, it's just one of the things I've always thought there when I've. Uh, seen some of her work and some of the people that referenced it and things is just sort of vague references. And again, it's, it's, it might just be that, you know, she doesn't know what fungi she's seeing. It's actually quite difficult and expensive to sequence it and get the genetics. So you're just looking at mycelium and try to make broad categorizations, which I totally understand. But if we're, you know, I've definitely in the future of love, just like with indigenous microorganisms and some of the Korean natural farming stuff where they're just growing wild molds and adding it in, uh, you know, I'd love to see more fine-tuned research, which I hear is occurring in that realm to figure out exactly which species are going on. And because once we know that, we got, we don't know what we're talking about. We got to get our basic grammar down and our terms and which species, and then we can look at well, and then study them individually. You know, under control settings, they prefer this type of food. Uh, you know, they have a preference for you know 
there's many different foods in the soil and which ones are eating what. And then ultimately when we, and then which ratio do we want of these dozens of different fungi? And now that's obviously quite complex, way too far in the future for us right now when we just want to make it happen. But that's where I think we need to start thinking. Um, at least this is where my mind goes with it. As far as going back to what your question was, there is lots of fungi in compost. There have been, I've actually only found one study and uh, maybe there's something new that I haven't come across, but I've looked in this a number of times over the years of, okay, fungi and compost, because I get this question every so often. There's one that I've found where they, they did all the work, they made a normal um, uh, aerobic compost pile, and then they also had vermicompost, and they compared the fungal communities in both. And there was, um, mostly what it just concluded was there was, I think, 120 in one group and 150 different uh, species or taxa in the other group and there was a good bit of overlap and that was pretty much the conclusion of the paper again not a real strong conclusion which one's doing what and which one do we want and when it comes out of the soil or out of the compost pile which ones survive in the soil and do the good things there you know so um and ultimately there isn't some perfect protocol to get the most perfect fungi because we still don't even necessarily know which of these micro, many micro fungi that we find in composts and soils and molds rather um are the good ones so again, it's it's a roundabout way of me saying I don't know, um, but it's sort of the the line of thinking we we you know just we need to realize uh, that that we don't know, and I think it's really important in the realm of mycology and in all sciences and things to really actually really acknowledge when we what we don't know, so that the next generation or ourselves uh, can actually answer the question rather than coming up with sort of simpler or shorter sort of little snippets, and it, for simplicity's sake that it, it, it eases the conversation, but it doesn't propel the, the harder thinking that we kind of need, especially in this topic, which is obviously very important. Um, you know, in, in as much as, you know, how can we get the, you know, again, cultivate more fungi in our soils and things, it comes back to some of the stuff that I was talking about in the, the last, with the last question is, you know, as far as the molds go, they seem to just show up as, as compost makers know, the more diversity of sources you get, the more diverse organisms you're going to get. Um, ideally, they're coming from healthy systems. If you're into the Korean natural farming thing where you're basically harvesting wild molds in the forest using rice, that sounds great. Um, that's a fairly newer realm to me, and there's not a lot of research there. And I don't, you know, I'd love to see that further develop in the West and all that to see how, because that seems to be obviously a great notion. Um, but uh, as far as, you know, the best practice to get the most fungi in your compost or in your soil, there really isn't a great strategy other than, you know, I'd follow along with, with Dr. Ingham says, just net recognizing there are some generalizations uh, out of necessity, I think, based on, you know, what she's maybe able to say, or at least for her to translate to the be beginner as well. Well, let me, let me hold you there. So here's some hard thinking on that. If we look at soil, whatever's in the soil, when we start is whatever's in there. If we're not tilling, and we're, we can't get anything a foot deep in the soil. A human can't inject it down into there without tools. The only thing that's going to end up in the soil is really what plants and soil macro and microflora put there and leave there. So knowing that, that you're going to have the bodies of organisms in the soil and you're going to have roots. Let's say we just, when we're done with a plant that we want, we cut it off, we leave the roots in the soil. And we're going to have all the exudates from plants while they're growing, going into the soil. What does your gut say are the types of fungi you want to encourage or add to the soil to thrive in that environment, knowing that those are the food sources? I mean, you know, again, it's, it's, I would want diversity of kind of as many fungi as possible. You know, the, the unfortunate thing is we, because we we don't know what we've lost. We don't know what all this human activity for the last several hundred or thousands of years has done to fungal diversity, especially soil fungal diversity. Um, how many species have we lost? And and you know, which is a, a much bigger question. And you know, you again you kind of bring it back to um, well, uh, so for, for that, sort of almost from like a philosophical standpoint, I just want more fungi in the world and let's spread more of them and get them to proliferate and to not lose their diversity even if we don't understand which what an individual species does um you know again you can't and you can't necessarily there's there's not a strong correlation i guess is to come to try to answer your question is that there i sort of said this before where we can name a lot of soil fungi but we cannot 
correlate or connect them to a, a greater e- major ecological function other than just simply oh digest decomp- decomposition of you know pollen or something or or an, an insect um, shell or something like that and yeah they're they're eating stuff and they all just kind of eat stuff that's what I've been told by and large about most soil fungi um, the only so only a handful have been really like heavily looked at because of their pro- pro- prominence um, you know I don't know the history of trichoderma there's actually like it's it's one of these few groups of fungi that's actually gotten lots of attention. I don't. I'm curious about the history of that. At some point, some researcher realized how common they are and how like strong they are at fighting fungi. Put two and two together, maybe they could be used in cult, in agriculture. That's probably something like that. And then the AM fungi rose to prominence amongst the other types of mycorrhizae because of similar reasons. Super common. They're the most common mycorrhizal type and. Um, have all these implications for ecology and economy, um, so I've been given lots of research. But they're they're the you know these are some of the shining stars. The vast majority of fungi we just have a name for them, and that's just about it. So you know what are they doing? Which ones do we want? This kind of, I was sort of saying this before. Uh, which ratio and and how which what food do they need to grow the best? We really don't know. I mean, and I'm just be shooting in the dark to say anything other than let's you know mirror nature is the best I can come up with. Um, my uh, one of the things I was going to say before, and um, sort of going on the compost question, and my friend said this, and it's just an interesting notion. It kind of comes to what you're saying, but maybe just a derivative of the last question is he points out that with compost, especially cold compost, slow compost, you get a lot of smell, and that's implying that the the bacteria there it's it's rotting. It's it's you're losing nutrients, and things are escaping as gases uh, through scent, sulfur, and things. Uh, with fungal growth, generally, you know, you very rarely get much of a scent. You get an earthy scent. Uh, often, you know, the worst you get that sort of musty, fungally scent, and not so much in compost either, right? And usually, a good healthy compost, it smells good, and you can see, and we can test. We see lots of fungi, um, and and especially mushroom cultivation. We, there is very there's not a noxious scent for whatever that means. At least it doesn't trigger us to not like it and but also not a very strong scent generally coming off of mushrooms or their mycelium so his notion is that they're much they're much better at conserving nutrients uh, fungi don't waste through gas now compost you don't you don't really smell as much bad stuff per se uh, but you know you got i don't know a lot of steam coming off maybe there's some things coming away some stuff leaching out you know definitely so you know his argument and this is sort of just leaving it on the table for everybody to consider is maybe in the future our composting systems broadly need to be much more fungi based like heavily fungi based than bacterially based or at least uh they we need to do that right alongside our hot compost bacteria piles and we would not only be cultivating you know the, the edible mushroom mycelium, but really have a whole new system of just growing lots of mold, kind of like what IMO, uh, indigenous microorganisms does. We're just growing lots of mycelium, uh, mold mycelium. They start out with a little box of rice and they expand it through a bunch of steps. Maybe in the future we'll have a larger scale, more elaborate version of that that everybody does on their farm or in their backyard, which would be really interesting. And um, I don't know what that looked like. I don't know what species would be there, what methods would be included, but we can imagine certainly that that I mean, it sounds good. It sounds right. It sounds like we should be doing that. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting you saying that. And I'm thinking as we're talking here, it's almost as though nobody should fall in love with one style of composting, whether that's long form cold composting or short, quick, hot composting. Because if you think about what is in the soil, you're going to have all stages. You're going to have some young plants that die. You're going to have some tree roots that are old and eventually they die. And you're going to want fungi that can handle all ends of the spectrum. So composting materials that can break down very fast gives you the expansion of one type of fungi. Composting materials that are a little bit tougher to break down gives you another type of fungi. And then composting very woody material gives you another type of fungi. And you and you have some amount of piles that are all managed differently based on the ingredients because they're all breeding out different fungi. And then you add all that to the soil and they'll figure it out. But you're never just overloading on one or becoming beholden to one because we don't know. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, nature isn't that simple. It, it's, you make a great point. I mean, you're essentially describing decompositional succession, which is what we, we see on, on a rotting log. You get many waves of different f- types of fungi that come throughout the, the, the many stages of, of wood decay. It's not just one silver bullet fungus doing it all. 
Um, you know, again, they all they all work in concert. Um, there is fungi can do a lot. They can't do everything, and definitely not one species can do everything. And so this is certainly how we need to start thinking about it. They, it's one of the common things I encounter with with people new to mycology, or even some, someone invested in it. Is it for whatever reason, maybe it's part of our society or something, we want to whittle it down to that, you know, again, the magic pill or something and just sort of this is the one to do it all or it's an easy way to talk about things sometimes or wrap our brains around it. But you got to think systematically, uh, bigger picture, you know, ecosystem picture. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's what you just described is really, it's you're just mirroring what we find in, in decomposition is is many organisms, and especially as far as the fungi go, which I know a lot more about than the bacteria or something. It's we have lots of stages there, um, so yeah, uh, that would probably be the way to go. And and the system that does that will probably look a lot different and be more static than than like a hot compost pile. In in that maybe it's more um, you know carbon heavy and, and much lower on the nitrogen to to try to limit the amount of you know bacteria coming in to to do their thing. Right. Thinking about uh, fungi, and you were saying that they're very thrifty. They're not wasting a lot when they're breaking down. One thing people use a lot to measure compost piles is heat. In your experience, do you notice any output of heat from fungal breakdown? And I mean, this could be even observed in like a edible mushroom cultivation lab. Are fungi essentially not raising the temperature or are you seeing temperature increases when they start to break down? And let's just say wood. Well, you know, yeah, absolutely. Um, no, it's a common issue in a mushroom farm. Um, my farm is actually just kind of right behind me, right behind this wall. But we, in the incubation room where the mycelium is growing on the material, there's lots of metabolism, lots of cellular chemical energy going on, and that is dissipated as heat. And so you actually have to separate the grow bags from each other because if they're right against each other, oh, excuse me, um, they're right against each other, they will can cook each other and hurt each other through so much heat. So it can get quite warm in the incubation stage, and you have to uh, ventilate and to, to lower the temperature. So that's that's definitely going to be happening through, through the natural world too. Just a lot of the heat's more readily dissipated uh, depending on the substrate. Um, What's the hottest you'd want that to get? Well, in the mushroom cultivation, we uh, for most mushrooms we're we're growing uh, incubating. Usually, we try to maintain it anywhere from 70 to 75. Um, some species, you know, you might go 80, 85, but usually, when you get to that temperature, you're actually putting in energy in like a temperate uh, part of the world where I live. You usually need to input energy to get warmer. The warmer that it is, the faster they'll grow. Um, so, anyway, it's, uh, and it depends on how full your room is or your incubation space. You might not even need that input, then you actually need to cool down. So, but in the 70s is, is a good incubation temperature. Um, in a compost pile, I mean, there are thermophilic fungi that can survive um, higher temperatures. And a lot of fungi are mesophilic, just like us. We like to live at, you know, what we consider normal warm temperatures. And we die above, I forget, 120 or something like that. And same with mesophilic fungi. But there are then thermophilic fungi that that primarily live at warmer temperatures and in compost piles and, and other, I don't know, thermal vents and things like this, warmer, warmer environments. Yeah. And thinking about, you know, decomposition, wood chips are one thing that's really common. And this is something that it comes up a lot. I've toyed around with this. I want to present you with a problem here. I'm going to give you a, a pile of fresh hardwood wood chips. So it's a blend of leaves and branches all ground up. And you want to break them down as fast as possible. That's, that's the goal. That's what we're trying to do. And we can't reduce the particle size by grinding them finer. It just is what it is. How would you go about doing that or how would you think about doing that if you wanted to speed it up i mean the definitely the my go-to would be your your ever ready ever willing garden giant mushroom uh strafaria rugosa annulata especially with the substrate you described um i mean that mushroom if any of you, your listeners or yourself have grown it if if unless you you know uh, pour poison on it you know it'll rip through almost anything especially fresh uh, wood chips but your turnaround there, I mean, it, it, just raw wood chips is a good example. It might still take two two years, two seasons for it to really become essentially um, topsoil. 
So it's it's not by your depending on your your standards, your your meter uh, might not be super quick relative to spreading those out in a wood lot. I mean, it's incredibly quick. It might take you know many years for that to really fully break down to be not as visible. Or so that's a good mushroom. Um, you know, again, going through the systems we were just sort of discussing, uh, perhaps we need a better system, the right targeted com complex of, of molds and, and, um, well, not so much molds are good for, for, um, uh, wood decay, but rather the white and brown rot, uh, wood decaying species, which are typically more mushrooms and larger, larger, more evolved fungi. And, uh, the strafaria is one I have a lot of experience with. It's just such a killer mushroom just eats kind of anything so fast but there might very well be there's roughly 2000 white rot species and about 200 brown rot species and you know maybe there's some that are out there that are just not commonly cultivated they're not even edible the fruit body the mushrooms aren't edible not a lot of human history but the mycelium would just rip through those chips like no one's business way more than strafaria that'd be great to find out great question um again don't we don't have that great protocol the refined protocol um in, in that approach just yet makes total sense there's a lot of species of trial there probably some obvious choices if if i was to kind of go through the list to start with but i haven't seen anybody do a sort of comparative study with something like that if you were in a lab and you could control the temperature on that pile is there a temperature you'd push it towards to try and speed up the rate well probably for like a white rod species I mean, they're, they're growing on trees. Um, and so they're not going to be like in a hot compost pile or some sort of decaying pile of organic matter in the natural setting. So it's going to be a re re less, more or less uh, mesophilic temperature range, meaning from rough, it's going to be within that range, which is on the low end, you know, in the thirties up to a little over a hundred. Most mushrooms where we have a lot more data, which is where all the cultivation, you know, the lion's share of our cultivation knowledge comes from is, is the gourmet species, edible species and medicinals. Uh, the majority of them, they they're sort of have a um, sort of a growth curve or um, an optimal growth temperature and they grow a lot slower at the lower temps. Maximums roughly in the 70, 75 degrees for a lot of species, and then you get diminishing returns with higher heat. So it would depend on the species um, that we would trial in this hypothetical experiment. Um, but to throw its mycelium in there, keep it moist, you're just trying to get the mycelium to grow. You don't care about the fruit bodies in this example, which is great. Growing the fruit body, getting the fruit body to form is the hardest part of farming, mushroom farming. Growing mycelium is super easy mm -hmm. so long as you keep it from drying out and don't make things too dirty where it has to spend a lot of energy fighting off competitors you create the right conditions where all it can do all it does is mostly just eat 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 and a uh, good nice food like you described is a good starting place right amount of goldilocks water and uh you know good temperature which i would yeah as a starting place would be 75 but depending on the species might be a little bit warmer or something in terms of moisture that's another point that a lot of people talk about i mean you want it drier do you want it wetter is it that rung sponge Kind of amount of water yeah typically i mean again pointing to mushroom cultivation and this is what we find with growing the majority of molds and and other micro fungi on substrates is you're you're going for the uh depending on the substrate it's just a it doesn't always apply actually by definition but the phrase that's thrown around is field capacity where it's essentially it's holding as much water as possible without so much filling the void spaces with um large water droplets so there's still a bit of microscopically there's airflow the material that's fully saturated um so for different growing growing medium or substrates the amount of water and how you sort of measure that's usually by feel on the farm uh, will vary a bit roughly it's we say it's uh, between like a 60 to 65 percent moisture content meaning that if you take 100 grams of the material and you've hydrated it to the point you think it's done and then you dehydrate it in the oven, it would come out at say 35 grams. So you've lost 65 grams of water, meaning that it was at 65% um, moisture content. So those are again, sort of starting places, um, pretty good rules of thumb, but a lot of fungi, fungal cultivation molds or, mu more molds or mushrooms usually stick around that range when yeah. they're describing the, the preparation of the media. You know, one from email and back and forth, one thing you weren't totally sure of was oxygen rate relative to the decomposition rate. But in thinking about, you know, an anaerobic pile, in the center of that pile, there's either low oxygen or there's no oxygen because it it's just can't get there. 
are there fungi that can operate in ultra low oxygen environments? So if you did have that pile go anaerobic, could there be some fungi that could operate in there or do they have to wait for the anaerobic bacteria and, and other organisms to kind of run their course and then soil organisms come in, aerate that, and then the fungi go in? Well, I mean, yeah, there's a great example is the yeast that makes our beers and breads. It's an anaerobic species. Yeast are fungi. They're single-celled. Uh, the 99.8% of fungi probably uh, are filamentous, having a network of mycelial tissue, and a tiny amount are single-celled yeasts. Uh, but the yeast that makes our beer and bread is is an anaerobic species. There's yeast all over wild plants, wild fruits. Um, there's yeast everywhere. We know very little about the role of soil yeast, which is a, a category of soil fungi, very poorly studied. Um, there's soil, there's yeast throughout the oceans, um, which is, there's dissolved oxygen in oceans, obviously, so the fish can breathe, but it's very low oxygen levels, um, you know, lower depths and things. Um, so there are, and, and there's anaerobic, uh, there's fungi that can also survive, uh, filamentous fungi that can survive in anaerobic conditions. Now, again, the actual dynamics of which fungi are, are in those anaerobic cores, at which time during the compost uh, succession and progression, I don't know. In I don't know if that, I haven't seen like a paper that's really studied that or looked at that specific question. Could be interesting. Um, and there's some fungi that can also switch between normal respiration and fermentation to, to, to get their you know, chemical energy. So, but a lot of fungi tend to prefer an anaerobic, uh, or excuse me, aerobic environment. So say that pile runs its course, it's now topsoil. We add that to the soil. At that point, are we just providing nutrients for the soil organisms to feed from where now the AB fungi can go target those and transfer them over to the plant as needed. Because if, if the decomposers are done, in theory, there's nothing left for those fungi to eat. They, they go away. So are we adding fungal food? I guess is what I'm trying to say when we add that broken down wood chip pile to the soil. I mean, I don't think the decomposers necessarily go away if you move them from, you know, the pile over here to the garden bed over there. Um, there might be, you know, new stuff for them to eat there kind of just depends. Um, I mean, unless you really like pasteurize the compost after processing or after running it, then yeah, you'd kill most of the organisms through say a pasteurization process, but they're not just going to go away. Even, you know, the mixing it up and sort of diluting it if you do that with your compost you know some of the some of the tissue will survive their mold spores will survive um but they again it kind of just comes back to this big unknown question of you know how many are surviving which ones survive and then you know who's who's feeding off of what you know the fungi that are already in the soil how much are they what are they doing with the compost that comes in on a nitty-gritty level i mean we can see positive effects like we can say yeah we had soil the plant grows better and the, the fungus, the, the arbuscular mycorrhizae are accessing it and, and helping to some degree. But um, to a certain degree, a lot of the, the conclusions you read in these types of studies is just sort of saying we did this and this happened. The, the exactly why and how is maybe decades of and, and PhDs worth of, of actually looking really hard and deep to understand all the mechanisms involved and all the players involved and, and steps. Um, so I don't know. I mean, again, it's, these are all vague. My answers are always can only be so um, conclusive with stuff like this because I don't think we really do know enough, unfortunately, um, at this point in human history. What about this? Let's say you're doing all the things that you should be doing. You're growing plants. You're, you're adding some compost to the soil. But you want to feed the fungi in the soil, not from compost. Are there things that you could add to the soil from the top to get the fungi that are there working and, and yeah, working along like something you could pour on top. Is it fish emulsion? Is it something else that could be a fungal food that might not be in the soil at the start? I mean, there's, there's a great book by, um, Michael Phelps, uh, Phillips, um, uh, mycorrhizal planet, I believe. And it's, uh, one of the few books that's come out in the last few years on um, kind of translating all the technical literature on mycorrhizal fungi to a more lay, lay person. 
he's an orchardist first and foremost. And so the book is really written so that you provision the soil to feed the mycorrhizal fungi so that the plant benefits. And he has a lot of, he discusses quite a number of things in there. He, and that's a lot of this notion is he makes these sort of suggestions and arguments and let's add, you know, different fatty acid sources. I believe may fish emulsion is in there. Um, and it's a lot of kind of good ideas and the logic is, is pretty good, but you know, he doesn't really have much citations. I don't think this stuff has actually really been trialed. And as far as I was able to draw from the book, I don't know how much, you know, maybe he does it in his field and this is his notion. He thinks this is what's going on. But again, if you want to whittle it down to where's where's the numbers, where's the science, um, I don't think we have a lot. Of that. I don't think he necessarily has so much more. It's anecdotal at this stage. So that's a good book I would refer to for a really, you know, the, a lot of the book is dedicated to this thinking. Uh, so I definitely want to give you know, him credit for for all that and suggest people check that out. Uh, but a lot of what he's referring to is just, you know, beyond that is sort of, I think, more speculative. The actual protocols, you know, he suggests there is a lot of it's coming from the Rodale Institute I referred to earlier. They're one of our few good resources that have actually used uh, USDA money for a number of years um, to, to to work with farmers in the Northeast to trial a bunch of things, especially with our basket of mycorrhizal fungi, and just try to make some progress on this these all these looming questions we have. They didn't really look so much, I mean, as, you know, again, as far as I've seen, into this this type of really great question of what's the best food we add and you know you, you give it this one and then you get this exact result um i mean that that's got to have been done but it's still to date not a great no great protocols on it um you know i've even been to the um international vesicular arbuscular mycorrhizae culture collection in west virginia it's one of the world's collections of of arbuscular mycorrhizal spores from all around the world it's a dedicated lab um tiny facility it's such an important thing that and people can go to their website invam.wvu um, western virginia west virginia university.edu and there's protocols and methods and they have identification information on buscana mycorrhizae um, nowhere in there you're going to find you know anything about the right supplements to use and they're one of the world's leading you know research centers for this and and that was surprising to me these types of questions not being answered through all their all their information and then i go there thinking that it's going to be a bustling department and that students from around the world come there to study this very niche topic and in the 20 years that they've been there they've maybe had i forget maybe 15 grad students do like a two-month stint you know at a time and it's basically just one guy that's been holding down the operation for 20 years uh really unfortunate when i discovered that and it just speaks to I mean, just the lack of funding, the lack of research going into at, at an agricultural school uh, with one of the world's leading departments on these these incredibly important, arguably the most ecologically significant of all fungi is said to be the Arbuscular mycorrhizae. And I got one person on the job for 20 years. You know, it's it's pretty wild. Is that something where you could actually request samples from there? You can. You can. They. That's one of their services. Um, they. They have all types of strains from around the world. Um, so they showed me their their fridge. It was cool. I got to walk in it. Um, all their spores, spore collections. Yeah. Well, it's amazing talking about this because it's like, in the, it, you know so much yet we know so little in all of it. You know, like we kind of have the, this is what we should do, but. We don't know all the fine details. We're still kind of 30,000 foot on a lot of this, it seems. Yeah, I mean, the, that's the thing. I mean, that's, I, I, you know, realized this so many years ago. It's kind of comes back to what I said earlier on where for me, in as much as I might wish to spend lots of time and resources, and I, and I do where I can to develop a, a thought or investigate these, these hard-hitting questions, I, for me, and just my personality and I think my skill set really lends more towards the education. Um, and, and it excites me more to await the day when there's people much more knowledgeable than myself who who advance all of this and answer some of these questions. And then, you know, the science really grows. Again, looking, we have, I think, again, and I made this assumption early on in my interest in mycology, you just assume, oh, lots of people are doing it. Everybody's figuring out there's a whole world of mycologists. They're going to do it. Um, you can get that sort of a, a 
uh, perception, you know, watching things online or something like that, hearing people speak like, oh, there's so much going on. My college is just totally blown up. Everything's going to get figured out. It's like, well, no, actually, there's very few people doing it um, and definitely not enough. And it's one of the few sciences where on all levels of the science, the, the citizen scientist is actually welcomed. You know, in a lot of other sciences, they say the you know, the academics kind of, you know, look down on the, 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 the amateur, you don't have a degree and we, you know, your, your opinion isn't valid, that type of thing. Not so much in mycology. It's like, we need more people. We need to do it, do the citizen science, do it in your backyard, write a, however good of a quality paper that says something conclusive. Cause we, everybody wants to know in this, in this field, it's all interesting to us. Um, you know, I started with more of the mushroom stuff and it's just, you know, as with everything, you know, as you get on, uh, well, maybe not with everything, but for me, as time has gone on, yeah, I've gotten a lot more interested in um, these types of things, all the unknowns, the soil stuff, so fascinating, right? So critical, so foundational, and and a little bit frustrating with how little we know about what what should be some of the most important areas of research in in uh, in all ecological studies in many respects. Yeah, and people can continue to learn from you with your book, Radical Mycology, your website, Michael Logos. Here, here are some thoughts, you know, for, for, for ways I think people could easily get into to starting to propagate fungi. Uh, you know, one you mentioned was indigenous microorganisms. They can start cultivating that. They can just Google that. Pretty easy to do. Um, what, are, what are your thoughts on this? So a lot of people that I've talked to have this idea of you're adding a tea to the leaves of a plant because you want to introduce fungi to the exterior of a plant to provide a protective barrier. Most likely, a lot of times, the fungi are, are already there on a healthy plant. So if I have a healthy plant, I can assume that there's some sort of fungi on those leaves. Is there a way that's kind of quick and dirty, beginnerish, easy, that I could take a leaf from a healthy plant, cultivate the fungi on that leaf, multiply it out, and then go back out into my garden and spray that? Yeah, I mean, it's, um, again, not a really common protocol, um, but it'd be very easy to take any leaf and, you know, if you, again, just being down and dirty and probably the easiest way to make sure you're capturing something is to either learn to make or buy for a little bit of a markup online, a Petri dish made out of what's known as potato dextrose agar, PDA, incredibly common, um, fungal cultivation, Petri dish medium, easy to make, but also easy to acquire pre-made. And, you know, you probably get a stack of them, 10 bucks or 10 plates for, I don't know, $30, say, or somewhere, somewhere thereabouts. Um, and I would go to try to be the cleanest room of your house, maybe your uh, bathroom. Um, if you, you know, you kind of want to up the level a bit and maybe it's a little bit above down and dirty, but uh, try to uh, increase your odds a little bit. Just go to your bathroom, maybe after you take a hot shower or spray the room with some Lysol or just isopropyl alcohol, trying to kind of clean the air a little bit so you don't get mold spores of the air land, random, randomly landing on the plate. Um, and then go in, wash your hands, maybe spray them with a little bit of alcohol, isopropyl, pharmacy, um, over-the-counter alcohol, and just pluck the leaf. Uh, maybe when you pluck it in the field, put it in a clean Ziploc, bring it to the bathroom, and then just sort of uh, as, as best you can, put it onto the Petri dish and just sort of tap it on there, set it on there, sort of rub it around or just sort of do a, an impression of it and then lift it off. And all kinds of fungi are going to come, all kinds of bacteria as well. But you'll definitely, within just a few days, especially if you put it in kind of a warmer place, um, you know, 70, 80 degree room, a just a couple of days, you'll start to see stuff growing, and really anything fuzzy is most likely going to be uh, some of these fungi on the on the on the leaf. And then once you've done that, how do you how do you expand that out? What's the next step there? You think? Uh, well, it, you know, the there's not like a an easy solution because different ones want different stuff. But the 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 next step I would try again, sort of the simplest approach, would be to just take some wheat bran. Um, from the store, get it just lightly moistened so you don't want to overly wet it where it becomes clumpy and anaerobic. And then basically just dump that PDA. It, it'll come out of the Petri dish. Um, it's sort of like a gelatin or jello disc or hockey puck almost. And that should just sort of plop out or use a, a knife to sort of pop it out and just throw that into the moistened uh, wheat bran. And you could do a couple big Ziploc bags um, or even like a, you know, like a coffee bag or something a little bit more porous. Um, but just so that it, something so it doesn't really dry out, but it can also have a little bit of airflow and throw that in there. You're basically inoculating the wheat bran with these molds. And then 
not all of them will probably survive. Maybe one or two will triumph. Uh, but again, in a few days, you'll see just the mycelium running through. It'll look like a bag of mold. And you've cultivated it. And then from there, probably just mix it into your, your foliar spray you know, mixing system or however you do it as sort of an inoculation, an inoculum there. Uh, dilute it down and then go out and spray it on. You know, I haven't seen... Uh, that practice, I'm not as uh, well versed in foliar sprays and all their uh, different forms as as many other people as other people are. Absolutely, so that would be something I was trying if I was just kind of going in blind. No, I love the idea of it. it it's it's something I might take on. It's pretty interesting. That I mean, another easy way for people to plug in compost teas. What are your thoughts on that? Worth it? The effort? Are we doing anything? Or are we just making ourselves feel good? <laughs> Composting. Well, again, I mean. You know, I think people do get really good good effects from it. My question is, you know, as far as the fungi go, which ones are you breeding? I know that, um, you know, I've heard that people have tried to make like fungal dominant compost teas, and it basically it's it's next to impossible. Um, the the short periods, and especially the really violent, uh, for lack of a better word, I guess, or, or active aeration that you're supposed to do, or just like a rolling rolling boil, um, that's going to be pretty difficult for a filamentous mycelium network to establish in even if it can um you know when i grow mycelium in a liquid medium but we agitate it very little and we we uh, oxygen aerate it for just like 30 seconds every few days so that we don't really rip it apart by so much centrifugal force and um, disruption so you might be breeding some some yeast and things in there. Um, that could certainly be worthwhile. But the what you're supposed to do to get the bacteria to cultivate in, in compost tea is not a, a welcoming environment, I think, for most filamentous fungi. So, you know, it's kind of as much as I could say. Um, like I said, I have been told not too long ago that if somebody was trying to, to make They'd spent lots of time and uh, quite a bit of effort to try to make a fungal com- fungal dominated compost tea and, and just couldn't. Um, and that, yeah, but that's kind of about as much as I can say about it. You know, again, most I think a lot of the research in that arena, and I haven't looked into it again nearly as deep, deep as I think some folks. I think most of it is more anecdotal, uh, by and large, and it's it's people just trialing and, and getting some good results and things. But you know, my question is always going to come back to you know, I just which fungi are there when we're, if we're talking about the fungi. Um, Dang, I wish we could measure them and, and you know, be more precise on all of this. But uh, that's my bias. I mean, in just knowing what you're doing, could you breed out a filamentous fungi in a liquid successfully? It sounds like yes. And would you just have to remove that air agitation? Is that the limiting factor? Where people might- yeah, well, yeah, so exactly. So, I mean, like, like I said, I don't, um, you know, have it right in front of me to show, but it's very common if, if uh, the listeners aren't familiar with mushroom cultivation, an uh, uh, increasingly popular practice in the last decade is to grow uh, our cultivated gourmet medicinal mushroom mycelium is one of the earlier stages. We grow it in a liquid medium in usually a pint or half gallon glass jars. And it's a sh- simple sugar broth. You do you have to use some sterile labby techniques, but actually you can do them in your kitchen. They've, it's become that simple, and there's ways to really DIY it um, and get good results. And but then you you're feeding the mushroom sterile sugar water, so there's no competitors. It can just eat, eat, eat. But you have to provide oxygen because the water, like a like a fish, you need to dissolve the oxygen so it can breathe underwater. And we do that by by stirring it. Um, you can do it by hand by essentially swirling it in your hand um, in a controlled way to create sort of a vortex. Or there's a very common lab tool called a stir plate where beforehand you put a magnetic stir bar in the jar before you sterilize it. And then this plate has a built-in magnet that spins. So you spin the bar inside of the jar. That causes the water liquid to spin, causes a vortex, causes the uh, surface tension of the liquid to to break and air oxygen gas to dissolve into the liquid. So it's very commonplace nowadays in mushroom cultivation to do this. And and then we use that as, again, an early stage in the growing process. There's step, several stages after that. Now, in this type of discussion, yes, you could easily translate. I mean, they, they do that industrially. This home scale approach is a, is a translation, a, a scale down of an industrial approach to cultivating microfungi and mycelium that's been around for about 100 years. First developed... I think by Pfizer roughly almost 100 years ago 
when they learned that they could cultivate an aspergillus mold in large vats of simple sugar water, usually molasses wastewater and things like this. And that fungus produces citric acid in, in copious amounts. And they would use simple chemistry thereafter. They'd filter out the mycelium and they would dissolve or precipitate, rather uh, not dissolve, but precipitate out the citric acid crystals from the liquid that the fungus had released into this nutrient broth. And that notion of basically harvesting fungal exudates is now done commonplace, commonly across all kinds of industries for leather tanning, uh, food, textile processing, and it's in your detergents for your clothes. So that's very common on an industrial scale. And this could be easily applied for the, just the perfect you know, fungal uh, foliar inoculum. Or inoculant or, or spray at least um this is probably this is what they're sort of doing with those endophytes i was talking about in in short they're essentially taking the fungus isolating it cultivating it in liquid media and then in in these systems i just loosely described and then they spray essentially pure mycelium onto the surface of the plant to inoculate it and that's but these are like kind of targeted endophytes that were originally harvested from the interior of the plant propagated out and now applied to then they, like I said earlier in this talk, they, they land on the surface and then they burrow into the plant and establish. Um, what you're talking about are plants that, that are, are um, epiphytic fungi that live on the surface. So they're not endophytic, they're epiphytic. And they live on the surface of plants and we're propagating those and putting them on. And they're sort of like a, an above ground shield, whereas the mycorrhizal fungi are a below ground shield. And so again, you know, which ones are right? Which proportions? What percentages? Should we just have one? Probably not. Um, which, how do we get the good combo? I mean, just starting to look at a healthy plant around you and trying to mimic that, maybe using something loosely like what I described of, of trying to get it on a Petri dish and going from there. So would you spend time with compost teas or no? Oh, uh, I'm, you know, I'm not going to knock it. I mean, I think people get a lot of, a lot of benefit. I mean, I, I, I'm a mushroom grower, so I'm not a plant grower. So, you know, I, I can't speak from lots of personal experience and trying, trying everything and trying the comparison. So I will leave it up to, to people more experienced in that realm. Uh, but we, we have to think about, again, sort of just how these fungi function, I think is what I'm trying to bring to the table. Um, and actually understanding, you know, what are we talking about? Which type of fungi recognizing the diversity, recognizing the lack of knowledge that we do have. Um, and then which ones do we want to propagate? Do we actually, like I said, these, these companies are trying to, they're propagating endophytic fungi and they're essentially doing a foliar spray, but not for the surface coating that most, you know, compost tea people are thinking about. They're actually cultivating a fungus that will penetrate into the plant and do something entirely different. And, you know, that's, we can use these same methods I'm describing. It's all sort of, when you boil down fungal cultivation, no matter the fungus, there's only a handful of lab techniques you need to know to, to grow them out. Um, then it's the question of how do you apply it? Um, and then how does, and then, and then obviously thereafter you want to do it so it's consistent and gets you the results you want. Well, I'm thinking of this in like a, a nature situation. We don't know without a lot of tech what we're breeding how much of it and, and what it's doing when we add it to the soil in a lot of cases. So maybe the whole mistake around this is, is we're looking at this a little bit upside down. Stop trying to add stuff to the soil, the fungi, and instead provide just a healthy environment for them and let them multiply themselves out. And we do that. So we focus on just growing plants have a have a, an, a nice ecosystem above ground, which is going to create that ecosystem below ground and just let the fungi take care of themselves and stop obsessing about us forcing the fungi into the soil and putting the ones there because we don't really know what we're doing at the end of the day. Well, yeah, I mean, again, the, the, just the challenge, I mean, that would, for me, that's definitely the, the end goal. But the, the problem is, again, we don't really know what we've lost. And so we don't know, um, you know, which we look at what we see today and, okay, this seems to be the healthiest example or the healthiest pattern. Um, and we can look to like a, a dense forest or something around where I live and try to, but you can't really mimic, you know, a dense temperate forest for your, for your vegetable garden. So what, you know, is the next best example of that? Um, that's local as opposed to, you know, some other part of the world with a different type of ecology that I'm trying to mimic. Um, you know, so it's a, it is a little bit of, you know, you, you sort of hope for the best, but we, 
but at the end of the day, we have stripped away so much. So I think we do need to bring in some of these fungi because, yes, in time, insect deposits will bring in a spore here and there. They'll drift along the wind. Spores travel across the ocean on wind currents. Um, the mycelium will travel through the soil. The worms will carry it through the soil and, and move uh, spores that way, which is how a lot of underground fungi do. Uh, they re they rely on insects and other organisms to move their spores. So yes, that slowly the drift would occur. Things would go where they need to be. Nature would would find its balance. I just don't know how long that might take. You know, they they say in a there's been one study that I've found that postulated based on you know some studies that in a post-disturbance forest that it would take roughly 40 years for the ectomycorrhizal mushroom populations to more or less come back to a stable point to where they were pre-disturbance that's assuming that the disturbance wasn't complete deforestation and soil compaction you know if you if you remove the entire plant community that uh was essential for you know this type of mushroom ectomycorrhizal mushroom to live that mushroom won't come back till that plant comes back. And, you know, how is that plant just going to naturally come back? Is it going to seed going to drift in or, you know, has the entire surrounding been so deforested that it's very, it's going to take a very long time and very little disturbance by humans for centuries before sure the tree might reestablish. But, um, you know, this is the notion of in succession where you, 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 it's not a circle, it's a spiral, right? You know, think there are patterns, but things, things are moving in some sort of direction, you know, is there, there's not necessarily an end goal, but there's not true, a true complete return you can never truly restore an environment. I don't, I don't like the term restoration because you, you can never go back. You know, we can try to regenerate a disturbed habitat and try to bring it uplifted and bring it back from being suppressed and, and, you know, hurt and things. Uh, but you have to recognize there will be a change over and what can we do to make it sort of the next best iteration of space is only going to be based on the best, you know, best design, best to our knowledge approach that we have at this point in history. And when it comes to the fungi, so much of that is shooting in the dark. But, you know, a fallback rule of thumb for me is trying to bring in more as much diversity as possible, especially if those the diversity of fungi is locally sourced from other fairly healthy nearby environments to, again, speed up what nature would do in in, in some sort of geological time scale. No, I, I think that's really well said. And you know, one thing that I'm trying to talk to a lot of people about in this series, part of it is, is biochar. It's a big topic that comes up a lot. Just thinking from as a mushroom grower, I give you a piece of charcoal. It's it's mostly carbon. It's not pure carbon, but it's mostly carbon. What do you think fungi look at that like? Is that a food source? Is that something they don't care for? Is it is it positive? Is it a net neutral? How do you think that's viewed? Um, well, there's, no, there's a pretty good amount of research and, uh, when you incorporate um, biochar or just you know char, charcoal into soil systems or different fungal um, inoculum strategies and even um, mushroom cultivation strategies. People have used it as a substrate um, amendment. And by and large, the results are usually positive from pretty much everything I've seen. I think in a lot of studies, if anything, you might find that, you know, they'll, depending on, there's all different ways that it's been applied from remediation purposes to uh, plant propagation to fungal propagation, but often the addition of biochar is never really a negative. If anything, you might not get much improvement. Um, they've certainly looked at um, charcoal after uh, under a scanning electron microscope, so one of those really high magnification microscopes, and after inoculated with fungi, and the fungi are burrowing or you know penetrating into the all the pores. Um, those pores, as you probably know, are great reserves for water and for uh, metals and minerals. Um, they're, they're charged sites, so minerals, um, charged atoms in the soil will sort of go on and bind to those sites. Fungi can go in and through their acids and, and skill set, uh, pull out those reserves. So, you know, this is why charcoal is such a great additive um, in South America so long ago because it helped build, it, was, it was a nutrient reserve. So it, by and large, it seems to work well. There's definitely been studies showing that in a remediation type setting that the addition of biochar uh, alongside fungi, depending on the, the toxin, typically is, is helpful. 
Um, and then like in the mushroom cultivation setting, it usually it's used, it's, it's not, it's not bioactive. It's not like soaked in compost tea to be full of bacteria. That would be uh, antagonistic to the mushroom. Mostly it's just the actual char, the porous material. It's beneficial in this setting where we soak it in water. It holds tons of water and it becomes a water reserve for the mushroom. So that, and that translates to a higher yield because one of our limiting factors in the grow blocks is how much water it can hold. So, I mean, this has been really enlightening. I love the work that you're doing with all things that you're doing. Mygo Logos is one of them. Radical Mycology, your book, it's coming out for print again this fall. I mean, Mygo Logos, what is it and why might people want to plug it? Yeah, so, well, I wrote my book um, uh, a number of years ago after, at that point, almost 10 years of teaching in various capacities and, you know, in so many ways, trying to get people excited about mycology, normalizing it, opening your eyes to these topics and many more. And, you know, trying to uh, show people what they've been missing out on. And what I realized after doing kind of all kinds of events and things is that even if I gave them great starting places, they didn't have a good resource to follow up with. I mean, I, mean, I tell them my favorite books, but having read all of them, I knew that they fell short in different ways. So I that's what led me to write uh, my book, which is uh, sort of the book I always wish I had had growing up. It's it's the the best information, my favorite highlights, the most useful skills, kind of all in one source. And but really, in as much as I think it's a great starting place, each topic discussed is in itself just a starting place on each of those topics on upon which all of them I could elaborate so much more and knew that while writing. And after the book came out, and uh, was well received realized that you know the next step is to basically take these topics and after having done all the research and writing and you know i had to cut out so much there was i already knew i had so much more i could uh, express and share and so that led me to founding michael logos which is the world's first online and in-person mycology school um so of course many people have been teaching all kinds of fungi classes on all kinds of capacities for many years. Um, and some people do some online stuff, but we are the first to really be all encompassing, not just in teaching classes that way, but we have a certification program. Um, uh, we'll, we'll be teaming up with universities, hopefully in the not too soon future, things have been gotten a little bit rough this last six months, um, trying to finalize some of the things there uh, so that people can get college credit is what we're looking towards. Um, but really trying to not just teach sort of one-off classes here and there, although certainly you can take them if, if sort of like we offer sort of a beginner or hobby level type introductions to cultivation um, and mushroom foraging and identification, but also more advanced courses. So if you really want to go deep, if you really want to understand the stuff we were talking about here, for example, um, is explored as a part of a 14-week fungal ecology deep dive um, that covers everything nitty-gritty with lots of resources, citations, um, field projects. Uh, so it's trying to be, you know, essentially on par with what I would consider college-level courses uh, if you could take the more evolved and more advanced classes. But unfortunately, those classes don't exist in colleges. And so we're trying to provide this as a real academic um, learning opportunity but also provide those beginner classes. The, you know, one of our most popular ones is the one that's just for the complete beginner. You know, you may, you may not have heard about mushrooms yesterday and you just don't even know what's going on. And so we definitely have one just to totally start there on the easy step. And we just have a few open uh, and available right now, but definitely there are many more to come. So folks can definitely join our email list and social to follow along. Um, we're looking towards the end of the year. Things got sort of paused and delayed for the last little while for um, current conditions, but we're on the upswing. And yeah, looking forward to next year, if things go go well, to do a lot of in-person stuff as well, um, as well as the online. All right, right on, man. I want to thank you for sharing your knowledge with the world and taking some time today to do it. I love the work you're doing, and I hope this inspires other people to go out there and be, be the change when it comes to mycology. Yeah, I mean, thank you for having me. Um, I mean, it's it really is true that, you know, one of the things I, I, I say and uh, have said for a long time and really mean is that it's not so much tr as true any, anymore, but uh, I think still just depending on the community is that even just being interested in mycology and sharing the stuff you're learning and telling your friends, you know, tomorrow, what you heard today, 
Um, that is a huge step forward for where mycology needs to, needs to go. I mean, in as much as you're able to invest in the knowledge and, and learn, you know, the nitty gritty is up to you. But my, my greatest hope is that we can all just be excited about fungi, be aware of them, um, and, and help sort of spread the awareness, spread and, and destigmatize them and, and embrace them for all their, their uniqueness. So, uh, and I love going deep, you know, real deep and into the weeds a bit on your show, um, where you kind of have a more special platform and, and an audience who really loves all the details. Cause that's, you know, there's a lot to love about fungi, but all this, all the details is I think for some of the most incredible stuff shines through. So thanks again for letting me, uh, go there and take everybody there with me. You know, the anecdotal, like the citizen scientist claims this. I mean, that's, it's kind of like, I guess the blessing and the curse, right? Like we need it because it's not being done in universities yet. Some of it is kind of loosey goosey woo woo. And do you spend time and money chasing that without knowing that somebody isn't just, you know, making it up? I mean, well, I mean, if you can, you know, it's, I wish that people were more transparent. It's like you said, I mean, I'm happy to admit when I don't know something. I mean, that's the only way we're going to progress as society is people are own up to what we do and do not know as individuals. It's just like, I don't know, I'm more proud of myself if I'm honest with myself and, and audience and, and it helps the student and, you know, everybody. Um, but apparently a lot of people don't do that. So, you know, I, I don't really understand that line of thought. Um, it doesn't, I don't think it serves anybody other than somebody's, you know, ego, I guess. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, the thing about mycology, at least in my experience, you know, part of the reason I am a little bit more rigid in some respects, I used to not be a long time ago, and like my book has tons of citations, is because, I mean, I don't know, just the mycology community is, in my world, is so small, and there is, every most most people are very science heavy and um because we know so little about fungi and there is a lot of confusion around it i think that the it's kind of clamped down on when because you know the people that know stuff don't want people spreading wrong facts and getting stuff confused so everybody's fact you know checking each other and be like no that's wrong in a help in a helpful way sometimes you get the ego type people but usually it's just like no we got to get our science really good because we're not gonna everything's gonna get all messed up if everybody's spitting wrong stuff so that was like you know, like with the remediation stuff, I used to promote that a lot more and still happy to do that. But a huge reality pill I had to swallow is like, well, you know, it's only going to progress if actually people understand like how science and chemistry and like, you know, you can throw spawn at something, but like who knows if it's working and we actually do the science around it. And it's not as romantic. And most people, you know, it's, most people don't, they want the romantic silver bullet, um, easy fix thing that, you know, they get sold um, on YouTube and stuff. So, uh, it's f for f what I've tried to just, the way that I try to approach it is kind of like how, you know, I talk about it in this talk and other places is, um, trying to excite people to that, that it's also exciting that we don't know enough, you know, it's, it's frustrating, but it's also part of the exciting part that anybody can contribute to it tomorrow, make the next big breakthrough. We need more people doing it. I didn't maybe emphasize it quite as much as I could have, but that's a big takeaway I always try to give is you can actually make a huge difference. It's one of the few sciences, you know, I, I briefly touched on, it's one of the few sciences where anybody can make, can make, and we need more people to make huge contributions, um, make your mark, uh, and, and help everybody out, help the world out. Um, and, and cause we, who knows what you will we'll all discover. And, but that's only going to come through being really clear about what we do and do not know. And if, you know, you sort of tell them a good story because it makes you sound good, but it leads people down the wrong direction. I mean, that's just, that's, that's, as a teacher, I just can't imagine doing that. Is there any thing that, that maybe we haven't hit on or that that's kind of short, like a one, two minute thing of like just a mycelium or a mycology mind blower, something that is just people might not know about mycology, mushrooms, fungi, and, it, you know, it's just, whoa, like one of those types of things if you told somebody. One of the mind blowers to me, I guess, it's just one of the most unusual things is the art, and we spoke a lot about them, is the Arbuscular mycorrhizae. They're the most unusual, it's not really an application thing, it's just sort of like, it's so crazy. Um, they're so unlike every other organism on the planet that this small group of roughly 300 species is argued and has been strongly argued to be an entirely unique branch on the tree of life. And there's several reasons for that. And the most unusual one is that their spores 
are are very large, visible to the naked eye, unlike most fungal spores, which are microscopic and you can't individuate them. But these spores are so large because they host anywhere from 800 to 35,000 genetically distinct nuclei, including the nuclei of other organisms, other types of organisms, and other types of fungi and groups of fungi. So what does this mean? You know, whereas most organisms, most animals and things only have one nucleus, one set of genetics, these ones have upwards of tens of thousands. In my mind, they're much like the genetic reserves, the 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 world's uh, you know genetic database and library in the soil. And when you understand that they're moving these these genetics all around through what they do, and they actually have been shown different species will will fuse together temporarily, swap their nuclei between each other and then break back apart, which is also not supposed to happen between un, um, species of, of different kinds. You know, two different species aren't supposed to be able to mate in this way. That also makes them unusual. And so they're essentially this totally bizarre uh, genetic barter bartering system below ground and which nucleus out of the hundreds and thousands is taking the lead at a given moment? Which genetic reserve are they pulling from to, you know, help this tree over there or, you know, release this compound over there? And how much of that is, you know, for lack of a better word, intelligence or based on some sort of genetic memory or an epigenetic response, whatever framework you want to use to describe the actions of organisms and, you know, the, the cause and effect of those actions there's something going on here that we don't find anywhere else in the natural world. And I had to find, I only found this, this, this fact, which is a fact buried so deep in the literature. And when I was writing my book, I spent quite a long time reading everything I could find, every paper on our buscino mycorrhizae, because the more I read about them, the more I realized how unusual they were, not just important in all these reasons, but all these little factoids. And if you read my book, I give them a nice big shout out and almost every sentence I have a citation because almost every sentence is sort of unbelievable how about how weird they are. Um, but with the spores being probably the the weirdest one. Yeah, it's amazing. So I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, they're, they're more, fungi are more like us than like plants. And I think people think the opposite. Yeah, I mean, the, I mean, the, we didn't get to the evolution thing, which is a huge topic, but the, um, you know, the, it's, it's essentially consensus, although you're not going to be, you know, hearing this in school, but if you look at the, the papers and stuff, and I, I cited it all, the thought is that bacteria came first on earth, fungi or something like them came to eat all the dying bacteria. Um, eventually plants and animals evolved out of fungi is the long, very long story short. And so they're, you know, they're the first eukaryotes and the more larger organisms evolved out of their initial structures. Um, I mean, that, that itself, I think, is pretty mind-blowing the first time you hear it, too. Hi, everybody. Thanks for watching. Subscribe here to get the latest from the show. Also, be sure to check out some of the great clips and watch the full interviews right here on In Search of Soil.